All right, uh, welcome to the uh, joint um, RGSQ and uh, C's um, climate forum. I think we've got a range of very interesting speakers over the day and hopefully a lot of really interesting discussion uh, about climate change and a variety of different aspects of it as well. Um, first, I'd just like to do the acknowledgement of country. So the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodians of the lands on which we meet. Uh, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Um, so I'll just do a little bit of the um, uh, background about where stuff or where you need to go in case of emergencies and toilets and things like that. Um, so if we need to evacuate, basically out that door there, um, there are evacuations up the back seat, but I think everyone's at the front. Um, so basically out there and just straight out the door in front of the steel building uh, as well. Um, that door over there is broken. You'll see a sign on the other side. So um, you won't get very far if you try to get out through there as well. Um, toilets are situated basically um, just directly behind me. Um, if people uh, need to use those facilities and um, I'll move on for oops, quest, well, opening the um, event. Um, so this is bringing together a range of experts um, focusing on climate and particularly focusing on how Queensland is preparing. Yes, the, the joys of hybrids, so Zoom and things like that. That. Um, anyway, so basically, uh, welcome to the expert panel and public forum in looking at how Queensland is preparing for a warming climate. So we're going to look at the science of the warming climate. We're going to look at policy and, and how we can adapt and mitigate to those changes as well. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a joint um, forum between the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland and the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Um, I'm the head of school of uh, School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Queensland, and we're very much focused on uh, climate research, both the science, but also the policy implications as well. And um, as I said, I'll get, I'll get John to introduce the program, uh, but our first presenter will be Helen Bostock, who's a member of staff here, and we'll be giving that scientific background as well. Um, just to give Helen a little plug up beforehand. So I'll hand over to John, um, who will go through the program. Thanks. Exactly. And I'll sort of also do a Perfect. Welcome, everyone. It is fantastic to have you all here today. Our public uh, forum on climate has been a long road. And it's fantastic that we are finally able to sit down and have some really valuable discussions. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, my name is John Tasker. I'm the president of the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland. We're jointly hosting today's events uh, graciously here at University of Queensland. As you can see from today's program, we have a fantastic lineup of pre presenters to give us both an overall outlook and a scientific perspective. And then walking through some of the key risks we face here in Queensland around both bushfires, flood, and health, which we're all increasingly familiar with after the past few years. <laughs> Lastly, we'll have a summarising with a policy context on where we can head to. And to finish today, we'll be running a forum, hence the chairs out the front, for you to ask your various questions before we wrap up for the day. It is a pleasure to have you here and very much please use this opportunity throughout to ask questions, particularly during our meal breaks, uh, and to continue the discussions around this very important topic. Without further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Arafni Childs as our MC for this morning's sessions. Thank you, Patrick and John. And uh, I'd like to um, thank Patrick in particular for organizing our venue this morning here at University of Queensland. It's, it's been much appreciated. Um, so I'm, my role is to introduce the speakers uh, this morning. And uh, as uh, of the, uh, as you can see, you've got the program with you, uh, and also you have the speaker bios. So um, you can be looking at those while we um, uh, introduce the speakers. But first up, Associate Professor Helen Bostock, um, as Patrick said, is Deputy 
head of school here. Um, Helen, it, Helen's research is um, a lot focused on oceanography, and she will be saying a little bit about that, but I'll let her uh, introduce her talk. But just one thing which, which is of interest, and she may not have time today or can say, uh, talk to you in uh, morning tea or lunch. She's just spent a few weeks on the research vessel inv investigator up in the Barrier Reef doing research. So that's been a very interesting part of her fieldwork. So without further ado, please welcome Helen to the podium. Thank you. Just turn that on. Can you guys hear me? Is that working? Okay, cool. Just give me a second to change over. All right. Thank you. And thank you. Yep, it's not working. It's not recording. Okay. It is. I can also record just in case. Oh, no, I can't. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, firstly, I'd like to um, thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, as I was introduced, I am an oceanographer by training, but hopefully I will convince you in the first few slides and over the course of this short talk on Queensland's climate change and future outlook, um, that the oceans are really quite critical for Queensland's uh, climate. And we really need to understand those oceans before we can uh, really understand what's happening with the future climate change of Queensland. So 70% of our planet is covered by ocean. And Australia is surrounded by ocean. So really we're the maritime continent, is how we're known. And so we really need to understand our, our oceans around us. And you can see here the, the clouds coming across the ocean, across Australia, bringing the moisture to Australia. So the oceans really do uh, play a role in our uh, precipitation and our temperature of Australia. And the oceans are a critical part of the climate science of the climate system. So the climate system is made up of the hydrosphere, the oceans, as I've been pointing out, the atmosphere, of course, but also the cryosphere, the ice, and the biosphere, and in, in a small way, the lithosphere, but that's usually over longer time scales. And I'm, in my research, very interested in the hydrosphere and the cryosphere, and, and I'm off to Antarctica, actually, um, in January to study parts of um, the ice sheet and ocean interaction there. So it's all about understanding all these interlinkages between these different parts of the climate system for us to really fully understand how our climate is going to change. Hopefully you've all seen these climate stripes around. And these were developed by a friend of mine, Ed Hawkins, who's in the UK. And he was sick and tired of trying to explain to people that climate was changing, especially you know, showing all these graphs and nobody was paying any attention. So he was really focused on trying to come up with new ways to illustrate how climate is changing. And this is one of the many ways he's tried, but seems to have been the most successful so far with grabbing people's attention. And so these climate stripes basically represent temperature change through time with the sort of 1850s on the left-hand side through to 2021 on the right-hand side. Unfortunately, we haven't got to the end of 22 yet, so we can't add our, our stripe yet for 22. But they're very striking. We can see that 
there's a you know, period of relatively blue ramping up to the red. This isn't total temperature, this is temperature anomalies. And I'm gonna be talking quite a bit about temperature anomalies. So I'm just gonna spend a short time explaining what we mean by temperature anomalies. So the temperature anomaly is basically the temperature above a background baseline. It does matter what we choose as our baseline. So typically we'll choose uh, a period and at the bottom of most of the slides, it will tell you what period that is. But typically it's a 30 to 40 year period where we look at the average temperature and then we look at the relative temperature um, from that average. And that's how they work out these, this is a global stripe, this is global temperatures. They don't just say, oh, it's warmed here or here. They look at the relative anomaly all over the world and they average it across. So Australia, <clears throat> we should be warmer than Antarctica. And so it's the relative change to where you are is what these represent. So it's pretty clear that the globe is warming. And this is of course, you know, what we're more used to seeing is these sort of um, graphs that show how temperature is, is changing, but really this is the colors behind and the stripes are just a representation of this graph. And if you want to go and find your global stripes, your temperature stripes, I highly recommend that you uh, go to this website and people will be posting, show your stripes for the upcoming COP27 that's going to be in Sharm el Sheikh um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so there'll be a big campaign on social media um, and you can go in and you can look at the globe, you can look at Australia and you can look for Queensland. But what these global stripes basically show is where we're at relative to where we were in the 1850s. And we call the 1850s the pre-industrial. So what was the natural temperature um, before we really kicked off our uh, climate experiment, as some of us call it, the climate experiment, the increasing uh, industrialization and the release of fossil fuels into the atmosphere. And so currently we are over one degree above background pre-industrial temperatures. There is a big ambition of the world to keep to below two degrees and preferably to below 1.5. And that was agreed in Paris, yeah, COP, 20, uh, COP 15, um, to try and uh, maintain global average temperatures to below two degrees. That's average temperatures, remember? So it will vary across the world. So this is the, the stripes for Australia and Queensland. I've got the global ones at the top, 1900 to 2021, Australia average ones in the middle and Queensland average ones to the bottom. And you can see there is some variability there's a lot more variability in Australia and Queensland than there is in the global stripes. And that's just uh, you know, really a representative of the fact that while the global temperatures are increasing, it does vary where you are geographically. But we're seeing the same trend. We're seeing the same change from blue over to more extreme red, representing the warming that's going on so this is just to show you how varied that spatial temperature change is. This is just a snapshot for 2020, but there are some nice um, YouTube videos where you can watch how it changes from um, 19, uh, 1800s through to um, 2020. And we can see that actually, while Australia is warming, we're not warming anywhere near as much as some areas of the world up in the Northern um, latitudes of the Northern hemisphere. We have the most extreme warming, um, and we also have clearly more warming over the land than we do in the ocean. So this is the temperature anomalies for Australia on the left and Queensland on the right. This is from that 1910 to 2020 and based on the Bureau of Meteorology uh, records averaging across Australia and then averaging across Queensland. 
and the background is based on a 30 year climatology that background um, temperature from 1961 to 1990. And you can see that's sort of where it's still fairly blue in our records. What you can also see is there's this general trend of increase, which was shown by those stripes going from blue to red. And we see here from blue to red, but we can also see that there are some warmer years and cooler years. And I'll come back to that. So we can see this trend, this increasing temperature trend. It's about 0.15 degrees per decade. And if we now were able to spin the graph and we put that black line now at the zero line, we can still see that there are some of these bars that sit above that black line and some that sit below. So we're still getting warmer and cooler years, but you can see there's a fairly cyclical uh, repeat of these warmer and cooler years. We can also see the same trend in the sea surface temperatures. So these are the temperatures of the ocean immediately offshore from Queensland and Australia, or Coral Sea and Tasman Sea. So offshore Brisbane we are, um, is the Tasman Sea. Just to the north on the Great Barrier Reef, it's the Coral Sea. And we can see similar rates of warming, just a little bit less in the ocean as we saw in that um, uh, global map, um, but also that same general trend um, increasing, but also some cooler years and some warmer years above the general trend line. We're also seeing an increase in the amount of heat waves. And the reason I bring that up is that heat waves tend to get forgotten. They are the biggest killer of uh, people regarding climate change. Um, and we tend to focus on really extreme immediate events like bushfires and flooding, but actually relative to heat waves, they, they have very few fatalities. Cities on this right hand side, you can see this is uh, the, the urban heat island map for Brisbane. Cities also exacerbate the increase in heat. So while we have this general heat rising or increasing temperatures, our cities further um, exacerbate this with all the concrete and also um, re reduction in vegetation to cool down the environment. So we, we really need to have a think about um, how we're going to accommodate this increasing heat and how we're going to redesign our cities to cope with it. And I know that most of Queensland is not cities, but we do have some pretty significant um, urban environments that we need to pay attention to. Now to look at rainfall. It's all over the place. There's no general trend, but we have some very high bars and some very low bars. So it appears at first glance that uh, climate change is not really influencing our rainfall. And actually, you may have guessed it by now, and some of you may have known this, these high and low bars, both in our temperature and in our rainfall, are predominantly driven by ENSO. So that cyclical high and low that you saw in those graphs is driven by this three to seven year ENSO cycle. So what we see is basically when we have a La Nina, like we're experiencing now, we get slightly cooler and much wetter conditions. When we have an El Nino, we have drier and hotter conditions. And that's driven by these temperature anomalies in the sea surface temperatures across the Pacific. So when it's cooler in um, Eastern Equatorial Pacific of South America, it's typically warmer over the Indonesian archipelago north of Australia. Warmer water allows for more evaporation and therefore more moisture and we get more rainfall. More evaporation, more clouds keeps us slightly cooler. So we get cooler and wetter conditions under La Nina, whereas under an El Nino, 
there's a switch in that pattern with higher temperatures over towards um, South America and cooler temperatures north of Australia, reduced evaporation, reduced rainfall. And because of reduced cloud cover, it actually heats up uh, Australia. Now, you may also be hearing about the IOD negative that's also occurring right now. So it's not just ENSO. We also have the Indian Ocean to the west of Australia that has a similar um, teleconnection going on, also linked to the oceans and sea surface temperatures in the oceans. And so sometimes, like we have right now, there's an interaction between IOD and La Nina. So occasionally we get it so that uh, the negative phases at the bottom here, um, where that is encouraging warm water, as is El Nino, uh, La Nina encouraging warm water. So there's double the warm water sitting north of us. Extra moisture, extra evaporation, which then means more rain for Australia. So really, I hope I've shown that while there's this general trend um, in climate change from temperature, our rainfall and our temperatures are also influenced by these more local climate teleconnections, as we call them. Um, and they're ones, of course, a lot of you are aware of and you hear about in the media. And so what happens when these two uh, phases when we have Enzo at the top, we typically get um, significant changes ac across the East Coast. IOD, Indian Ocean Dipole, actually has a much bigger influence more to the South. And that's possibly why right now Victoria is flooding and we're getting a little bit of a reprieve because the IOD influence on top of Enzo is pushing more of that moisture to the South right now. Um, I've hopefully convinced you that the oceans have a strong control, but also as well as the oceans controlling our climate, they're also being impacted by the climate change as well. So I'm not going to dwell on it too much, um, just one slide, but this is a um, very nice figure from the IPCC special report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate that came out in 2019. And basically the summary and take home is that while the oceans are influencing our climate, they're also um, helping to buffer our climate. So they're taking up almost 90% of the excess heat that we are putting into the atmosphere. I find that quite remarkable. It shows you how much uh, the oceans really do buffer us. And it's mainly because water has a very high heat capacity. It can take up quite a lot of heat. That's, however, having impacts and increasing the number of marine heat waves that we're seeing. And that's what's influencing things like the Great Barrier Reef, but also further south, um, we're getting more heat waves and also off Northwest Australia. So as this ocean is taking up more heat, the heat has to go somewhere and occasionally it pools in one place and we end up getting these, these marine heat waves, which are devastating for the ecosystem, but also they do have feedbacks into our local climate of Australia. The oceans are also taking up some of the excess carbon, nowhere near as much as the excess heat, only about 25 to 30%. And you may have heard of the term ocean acidification. More heat, less oxygen goes into the water. More heat, the oceans expand, so we get thermal expansion and, and sea level rise. And that's starting to change things like the density in the ocean, which has impacts on our circulation. So sea level rise around Australia, again, like temperature is not changing, um, just, you know, the same across everywhere, it, it is not uniform. We can see that um, Queensland compared to uh, the north of Australia and the southeast of Australia has slightly less increase in, in uh, sea level rise, but it's still increasing at a couple of millimetres a year. And we can see the global sea level rise is just ramping up up to 4.4 millimeters per year. It may not sound like a lot, but if you have sea level rise that's increased by 
15, 20 centimeters already, and then you have tides and storm surges on top of that. It's the reason why we end up with the Gold Coast flooding regularly uh, already, and uh, sea levels only just started to really kick in. And as I said, with the increased heat in the ocean, we are getting more and more frequent leaching of the coral reefs of the Great Barrier Reef. Now, these three years were all El Nino years, which are typically warmer, but actually in 2022, we also had bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef, and that's during a La Nina. So that was very unusual, and um, I think took everybody by a lot, you know, by a big surprise that this happened this year. So to summarize what I've just uh, thrown at you, um, there's a long-term warming trend. It's interrupted by El Enzo with cool, wet years of La Nina, Warm, dry years are El Nino. Rainfall is primarily driven by ENSO in Queensland and in Australia. And we've already got evidence that our oceans are significantly changing and starting to influence the coastal ecosystems, but also um, sea level rise in our coastal communities. So what's the future? Um, the IPCC report came out on my birthday last year. Woohoo! Great birthday present. Um, and I proceeded to spend all night reading it and then giving a lecture on it the next morning to my students. Um, this is really the take home message. No spoilers, but I didn't enjoy it. Worst choose your own adventure book ever. All the endings are terrible, but some are worse than others. Thank you, Brenda, for summarizing it so nicely. I'm just gonna take you back one step to the previous IPCC report, um, just to explain the different scenarios, because it's slightly easier when we think about them just with respect to the CO2 levels. So for the last few IPCC um, reports, they have focused on these RCPs, representative concentration pathways. These are basically scenarios for future. And these RCPs basically are the based on the CO2 concentration that is in the atmosphere with the lowest RCP 2.6, peaking at about 450 ppm CO2 versus the highest one reaching over well over a thousand ppm. And each increase in CO2 impacts the amount of radiation we get per square meter of the planet. So that's what the RCP stands for. RCP 2.6 represents 2.6 watts per meter squared of radiative forcing on the planet. This year, in May, we reached our highest CO2 concentration that we have recorded. Um, in the last million or so years of 422 ppm. And I told you that the lowest RCP has us peaking at 450 ppm. So we're not very far away from that lowest scenario. Um, and um, we're trying our hardest to get, keep up with the highest scenario. Just to remind you that there is a very strong correlation between CO2 concentration. You see along the bottom of this graph, this is measured at Hawaii. We have similar measurements all around the world for many different stations now. And we can see the global temperature anomaly relative to the CO2 concentration. And it's a very strong correlation there. So this recent IPCC, they uh, came out with some new scenarios they're still related to those original RCPs. So they're still related to the amount of CO2, but they also take into account a whole range of other factors. So in the low emission scenarios, it, it's around things like population, how we transition our energy, um, and what our socioeconomic uh, progress is and how sustainable it is. So these are called Shared Socioeconomic Pathways now, SSP. And on the left, we have the low and, and very low emission scenarios where the SSP 1 2.6 is the equivalent of the RCP 2.6. 
And then at the higher end, we go right up to the original RCP 8.5 is now SSP 5 8.5. Now, Paris Agreement aimed to go along the blue scenarios between those two. But I think the general consensus is that at the moment, unless we get our act together, we're actually aiming between these orange and red ones that I've highlighted here. So we're currently on track for the SSP 3 7.0. And I think people are hopeful that we might stick between the, uh, the SSP 2 4.5. And here's how they would look in a color stripe. So you've got the global color stripes on the left and then the futures on the right. And so we can see the highest scenario, we're going to quite black colors versus the lowest scenario, we still stay pretty warm, um, but not getting anywhere near the same temperatures as the high scenarios. And so this is how it might look spatially. Again, highest uh, warming in the high latitudes, both in the, the north and in the south, mostly over the land with um, warming around the, the oceans, but nowhere near as strong as in on the terrestrial environments. So what about precipitation? We know temperature is gonna go up. What about precipitation? This shows it going up and down. And so really what is going to happen to precipitation under all scenarios is that we're going to basically exacerbate the current uh, hydrological cycle. So where it's already dry, it's gonna get drier. Where it's already wet, it will get much wetter. And that's what these show. Even under the lowest scenario, you can still see that there's increasing precipitation in the tropics and decreasing precipitation in the subtropics where it's typically drier anyway. And it just gets more extreme as we go across to the higher um, scenarios, higher emission scenarios. What's it gonna look like for Australia? Uh, we have the different scenarios now, top to bottom with the lowest scenario at the top and the highest scenario at the bottom. And we can see that on the left two panels, there's gonna be significant warming slightly varied across Australia. And with the precipitation, it's mostly drying in the Southwest, possibly a little wetter down over Tasmania. But when we look at the maximum precipitation, if we do have rain, it's gonna be more extreme. So Australia will typically become drier, but when we have rain events, they will be more extreme. And that's because for every one degree temperature rise, the evaporation or the moisture content of the uh, atmosphere increases by 7%. So that atmosphere can hold a lot more water than it ever used to be able to. And therefore, when we get rain events, they're typically heavier. As part of the IPCC report that came out in August last year, they also put out this IPCC interactive atlas. So you can go and explore this yourself. It's a way of making these climate models more accessible to people. And I'll flick through these quickly, but basically this is the uh, temperature change. This is the more extreme temperature change. This is the wet bulb temperature. So this is 35 degrees. This is considered human uh, survival, survival limit. Above 35 degrees, humans cannot survive without aircon and other kind of ways to keep us cool. So we can also see that there's quite a few countries around the world, Africa, Asia, South America, Australia, where this wet bulb temperature, we're gonna get increasing numbers of days where it's above 35 degrees. And in many of those areas, thankfully not in Australia too, too much, uh, many people do not have the, access to, to cooler conditions. Again, rainfall. Now, I'll just go back to the rainfall because you can see these hatchings on the model output. That means that the models don't agree perfectly. 
So what they're telling you is that some models are suggesting this, the general consensus is this, but some models disagree. So you can see where it's typically much wetter and a few places where it's much drier, but where it's sort of in between, we've got these hatchings. And that's because places like Australia, remember our rainfall is not necessarily driven by climate change, it's driven by ENSO and these teleconnections. And we don't fully understand how they are going to change in the future. Some models, most models now, actually suggest the intensity of ENSO is going to increase. So when we have La Nina events, they're going to be wetter and cooler. And when we have ENSO or El Nino events, they will be drier and hotter. And the frequency of these extreme events is going to increase. But as I said, we don't fully understand ENSO, what's driving it, and a lot of the models don't always agree. What we do know is it's gonna just get more variable. The oceans are also gonna warm and sea level is going to rise. And this is what future Brisbane and the Gold Coast might look like under 1.5 and two degrees. So 1.5 is in blue, two degrees is the extra areas that will be flooded under two degrees of warming. You can see that uh, the airport is, and the port is pretty much gone. <laughs> UQ will still, here, still be here, although we might have lost a few of our playing fields. And the Gold Coast is pretty much disappeared. Queensland has a very nice climate dashboard. I suggest you go and have a look if you're interested in specific areas of Queensland of what might happen. Here's the mean temperature for 2070. For Queensland, based on that dashboard, we can see that it's going to rise between, on average, about 1.8 degrees by 2050, a little bit more by 2070, and well above 2.5 2 to, 20, to four, 4 degrees under the highest scenarios by the end of the century. Heat waves gonna significantly increase across Queensland, doesn't really matter too much where you are. Precipitation, again, unclear, some increases, some decreases. Um, again, it will be strongly driven by ENSO. So future outlook, as Brenda, the disobedience penguin put it, all futures are grim, but some are worse than others. So it does depend on which scenario we choose to take. Um, at current emissions, we're, we're on the higher end. Queensland will likely get hotter, especially inland, increased intensity of heat waves, and longer, more variable rainfall with more extreme ENSO. Dry years will be drier and wet years even wetter, and sea level will continue to rise, probably around one meter by 2100. Still got a bit of time, so um, is that right? I've got a bit of time. Yep. Okay. Um, so where are we at? Well, this COP twenty seven is coming up. This is what was pledged at COP twenty six. So um, we've got a lot of work to do at the moment. The targets, and these are only the targets and pledges, are at two point one degrees above. Um, so just a bit above the Paris Agreement of trying to keep it about below two degrees. But of course, these are only the targets. We need to see some action um, to actually start going towards these targets. Australia under the climate tracker is insufficient um, and uh, has a lot of work to do. The current government has done a little bit more than the last government, but there's still a lot more that we should be doing. We're in the insufficient category and greater than three degrees for most things. And I just thought I'd give a bit of self-promotion. We are heading to Antarctica, as I said, in January to try and study 
climate change, the interaction of the ocean and the ice. And um, of course, this matters to Queensland because ice sheet melt is one of the biggest contributors to sea level rise um, and will have impacts on a whole range of ocean processes. So if you're interested, um, feel free to, we're, we're heading down to Cape Darnley, um, which is on the sort of Western end of Australia's Antarctic territory. And we'll be uh, posting on social media if you're interested in following along and seeing what we find out. And um, I have a bunch of students coming with me who will be telling you about life at sea and what they're up to and why they are studying Antarctica to understand climate change. Thank you. Yeah, any questions? Yes, Scott. Yeah, um, just thanks for that. That was a really interesting talk and um, yeah, gave a really good, uh, I think, outline uh, and particularly the future, what we're heading towards. Uh, but I was just, in, I'm re always really interested in the weather. Um, and I just when you showed the ENSO and the IOD, is it typical that there is correlation between those two? Because it seems that the IOD is, uh, is driven by, again, waters off the north of Australia, the, the temperature of those waters. It they don't always overlap. It's actually not that common that they overlap. The last time we had a negative IOD and a La Nina was 1974. So it's not, not a particularly common thing, but we think it's going to get more common because they will tend to work together. Yeah, good question. Lovely. Thank you very much for the presentation. First question is, you didn't include SAM and those collection of climate uh, indicators. Uh, does that mean it's not important? But probably more importantly, the problem we have is our instrumental record is far too short. So 1750 was, was the more than minimum, the coldest place ever. So we've probably introduced a sort of a slightly skewed trend there, if we'd corrected for that. So from that question is, if we look at our paleoclimate, um, have we anything to learn from that? You know, Tessa Fences work's gone back a thousand years. I think she's in the process of doing the last 2000. Go back 10,000. The ENSO event seems, I understand, and you may know better, a very recent phenomena. Uh, 10,000 years ago with Sahel, you know, when we sort of had a lot more land above water. Uh, it seems to have intensified since 5,000 years ago. Is without yes, a, a yes. PhD thesis on that, can you summarise where we're going wrong or, or what we can learn from the past? So lots of, lots of things to unpack there. So uh, I'll start with the last one, which is, yes, um, the paleoclimate records do show that there was ENSO in the past, but it was definitely less frequent and less extreme. And there's definitely evidence of it increasing in extremity and becoming more frequently frequent and it's partly driven by the fact that you know we've got this big warm bod body of water called the Indian Pacific warm pool to the north of Australia which is basically 29 degrees and above it stays fairly fairly constant um, and in the past you know when we had lower sea levels there was less water there and, and less driver of this extremeness so yes there is evidence of ENSO in the past, but not as frequent and not as extreme. SAM is important, but not so much for Queensland, which is why I didn't really focus on it. ENSO and SAM interact, and they have a big impact on the climate in southern Australia, but we're really dominated by ENSO up in the north of Australia in Queensland. Um, with IOD interacting with that ENSO, but we're predominantly driven by ENSO. That's why. Oh, sorry, SAM. Good point. SAM is the Southern Annular Mode, and it's basically 
the shifting of the westerly winds to the south of Australia. So when we have a SAM positive, it, the, the westerly winds are to the south. And when we have a SAM negative, the westerly winds to the north. And it, when they're positive, it tends to um, increase the temperatures in the southern part of Australia and dries it out. When those westerlies come north, they bring moisture and they increase the amount of precipitation in the south of Australia. When ENSO happens and warm waters pool up there and push, they sometimes exacerbate the SAM and can push the SAM positive south because you've got um, the change up north. So there is a little bit of an interaction between all of these different teleconnections that influence Australia's climate. There was one other question. Oh, <laughs> paleoclimate records. And even if we go back, um, so Ed Hawkins, who, who developed the climate stripes, He's got climate stripes that go back um, 10,000 years and we still see the same massive change. It does depend on where you draw your baseline, which is what I was trying to make that point. Um, but even when those graphs that I was showing you, they choose the baseline from 1960 to 1990. So it's well past any of those cooler periods that are known in the past climate record. So it's well within our recent records where we've got very good records um, and we can do a very good job of working out the anomalies. We can learn from paleoclimates um, about there are times when it was two degrees warmer on average in the world back in the marine isotope stage five, which was about 125,000 years ago. It was average global temperatures were two degrees warmer. And so there's quite a lot of work going on to look at what sea level was doing back then, you know, how did sea level respond to two degrees, but also, you know, what did vegetation do, what was rainfall like, all those kind of things. So we can look back at past time periods to try and get a bit of an analog for what we might be about to experience going into the future. Hello, yes. It seems to me that a feature of the warmer climate is we have high pressure and low pressure systems that move very slowly and often get stuck. This can cause heat domes over northern Australia, which give us those northwesterly winds. And it also gives us intense low pressure systems, like there was a cyclone that moved across north Queensland a couple of years ago, went through very slowly and killed about a million cattle. And of course, we had the river in the sky in, in Brisbane in February that uh, didn't just go through. It, it, it got stuck there and northern Brisbane got a metre of rain in three days, which is unprecedented. Is this a, a factor of intense systems moving slowly and, and getting stuck? Yeah, it, it seems to be part of this change. And um, what's really interesting is that under La Nina, we should have got more cyclones. That's what's happened in the past. And in this last couple of years, we actually haven't had more cyclones, but we've had more of these intense storms and they've moved slowly. So I think we're still trying to understand why this is, but it seems to be a feature of what we're um, seeing across the world, not just in Australia, we're seeing these patterns across the world that things are moving less slowly, more extreme rainfall events. Um, and so I think this is part of that hydrological cycle increasing, but also the wind patterns are changing as a result of climate warming. And we don't fully understand all of these processes as well as we should. Any questions online? Don't see any. If you have any questions, please. Um, put them in the in the chat. Um, uh, thank you. I'm concerned about the future predictions uh, based. Oh, I think uh, I'm concerned about the future projections based on the existing science, which is quite robust. But the situation is that probably if we don't achieve something like a 75, 76% reduction,
reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030, we will have catastrophic consequences starting even earlier than that with the sea level rises associated with the loss of the Great Barrier Reef, for example, receding, uh, sorry, not receding, the uh, intensity of them uh, taking the sea level rises further inland along the Queensland coast. Uh, I think we're working too much along straight line uh, interrogations where there's increasing variability and we have the problem uh, that this is developing into an era, area of uh, complacency. Okay. Yeah, I think if you're not terrified, you should be. Um, I think there's a competition amongst my colleagues and, and I who lecture on climate change as to who can be Professor Gloom the most. Um, but I think there's a lot of things we don't fully understand about the feedbacks in the system. As you say, that, you know, are they linear? Do we reach tipping points? Do suddenly things stop? You know, um, ecologically, things like the Great Barrier Reef, what is the tipping point for that reef system? We don't know. And probably for different creatures, it'll be at different temperatures, but that will start to shift the, um, the diversity within the ecosystems and the functionality of the ecosystems as a result of if you take a couple of organisms out, what does it do for the rest? You know, things like crown of thorns seem to be able to tolerate quite high temperatures. And if other things are struggling, well, you get an outbreak of crown of thorns, it basically devastates your reef. So we're already starting to see some of these ecological tipping points likely happening. Um, I think there's a few things we're still trying to work out, but in general, there's a lot of robust science behind it. Um, and, you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it's mostly we don't know what path we're going to choose and which of those scenarios we're going to take. And if we take and make a lot of effort, and it's really pleasing to see the, the Queensland government putting a lot of funding into renewables and things um, to shift away from our coal. You know, Queensland has the highest carbon footprint across Australia. We are the most dependent on coal for our power generation. And um, we have the highest capacity for putting in solar. You know, it, it, it's really a no brainer, but uh, you know, we have to start making that transition quickly because yeah, 2030 is gonna be here within a few years. And you know, these things are gonna happen quickly and it's adaptation, mitigation, all these things are gonna have to happen hand in hand where adaptation is learning to live with the new climate um, state and mitigation is trying to reduce the further climate impacts from keeping our emissions down. And I'm looking forward to hearing some of these other speakers who are gonna follow, who are gonna talk about some of those um, adaptation and mitigation um, because I've really been the person who's just um, told you about how it's happened and what the future predictions might be, but now we've got to talk about the action we're going to take. Okay, thank you, Helen. I think we'll call the uh, questions to a halt there. Of, of course, in the panel session this afternoon, there will be another opportunity to, um, to ask Helen some more questions. Can I just ask, can you hear at the back adequately with the um, lecture, the speaker? Okay, that's very good. Um, so we'll just uh, now get uh, the next speaker's PowerPoint up, but while we're waiting for that, um, I guess uh, we, we couldn't be holding this at a more appropriate time. The COP27 begins on November the 6th in Egypt. Um, and I was very ignorant. I didn't know what COP stood for. So I looked it up. It's conference of parties, which you know doesn't give you any idea if it's about climate at all. But that's COP and COP 27 in Egypt this year, as uh, Helen mentioned some uh, uh, points about the COP 27, and this year's will be COP 26 to 27. Uh, she mentioned 26, so it'll be in Egypt, 
running from November the 6th through to November the 18th. So we're in the advanced party on this conference of parties. <laughs> All right, so now we would like to introduce our second speaker. And uh, Lee Johnson is a former fire commissioner for Queensland. And as you can see in his bio, which you have with you, um, Lee has been very much engaged and um, active in the whole um, fire emergency scene for many years. He is currently also a founding member of Emergency Leaders for Climate Action, which I think is comprises a number of former co uh, fire commissioners from around Australia. So his talk this morning is on Queensland's fire, bushfire risk. Yeah. So without further ado, would you please welcome Lee to give his talk? Thank you, Lee. Thanks very much, Raphne. Very good uh, to be here. And thanks to the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland for having me back. And for those people who have heard me speak at the society, uh, this uh, lecture is similar, but modified somewhat. So uh, just to quickly, uh, thanks very much to Helen there for terrifying us. And uh, I, I certainly will be uh, covering some of the slides similar to Helen, so I won't uh, dwell on those too much, uh, but a bit of the background. I'm not a climate scientist, so don't ask me any difficult scientific questions, but uh, I'm coming at this from the practical implication of the effects of, on, of climate on my career. I was a career firefighter in Queensland from 1975 to 2015, and in uh, 2002, I was the Commissioner of Fire and Rescue Service, now called Fire and Emergency Services and about to change its name again, apparently, uh, shortly. So uh, 13 years as the Commissioner. Uh, Raphne said I uh, was one of the, the original founders of emergency uh, uh, leaders for climate action with my colleague, Greg Mullins from New South Wales. You've probably seen Greg a fair bit on the media, he's very active. Uh, he's a member of the uh, Climate Council as well. And the Climate Council supports emergency leaders for climate action. One of the interesting things about that is there's uh, farmers for climate action, there's teachers for climate action, there's doctors for climate action. There's an enormous array of people in our society who uh, got it a long time ago and really get it. So. It's been uh, a very interesting journey that, that we've been on. We came together uh, before basically the 2019 bushfires uh, that ravaged Australia and basically set our task on trying to convince the government at the time that urgent action needed to be taken. Um, as probably a lot of you know, we were thoroughly ignored. Uh, the fires occurred probably worse than, than we had anticipated. And uh, we've kept uh, soldiering on. And we'll certainly keep a very close eye on what the current government is doing towards uh, improving uh, climate uh, change adaptation. Uh, just to set the scene a bit further, in 2006, tropical cyclone Larry uh, hit Innisfail. And it was at, at about that time that from then on, I guess, that I started to realise, not knowing anything particularly about climate change, but we started to see a constant trend over the next few years of ma major natural disasters hitting Queensland. We'd had a reasonably quiet period from, say, 1990, cyclones here and there, floods, but it had been reasonably quiet. But I would... Uh, put to you that since 2006, Queensland has been hit by at least one major natural disaster, if not more than one, every year since then. The, the number of natural disasters that this state has dealt with is staggering. Um, I think there was one figure recently quite about 90 in the, in the last decade or more. 
So we are definitely known as the disaster state. And what that trigger from Cyclone Larry did for me as the commissioner was realise that we had to improve the capability of QFRS, or I'll still call it QFRS at this stage, um, to deal with major landscape natural disasters. That is, uh, my background as an urban firefighter predominantly, the, the bell rings, the red truck goes out, deals with the problem, comes back to the station. But we had to start operating more like the army or the military. That is, send people and equipment to XY coordinates somewhere in Queensland, no power, no water, no the whole disaster scenario, and have the logistics, the communications, the planning to support and look after teams of people in the field to deal with the after effects of cyclone, flood, bushfire, whatever it is. And how we got there predominantly, Queensland became the first um, jurisdiction in Australia to be recognised by UNHCR as heavy rescue, urban search and rescue team, and we're designated as Task Force One in Queensland, and New South Wales came second. No laughter? All right. Okay. <laughs> It, it carries well with my New South Wales Commissioner colleague. Um, so the logistics and the planning of being able to put people and support both full-time, part-time and volunteer staff in the field became one of my drivers. Again, me not really thinking too much about what caused it or why, but that's sowed the seeds for me to be more aware of what was happening with climate and how it was affecting in my case, how my organisation uh, dealt with and responded to what was happening in the environment around us. I'll just check that this works that way. No, not going to work. Ooh. I might have to click. That's not going to work either. We're stuck, Patrick. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. This is on. Which button? That one. Yeah, it's all across the floor. Okay. So Let's get going. As I said, some of these slides will contain similar information to Helen, so I won't um, uh, dwell on them. And pretty much you've seen this one before, but uh, what it's telling us is the place is warming. Um, and I absolutely agree with Helen, warming oceans are probably the biggest issue for driving changes to climate and weather patterns. Uh, again, you've seen this sort of information about how it's creeping up and why um, we're seeing extremes. And I, and I think today I've got the hardest sell, trying to sell bushfires in the current uh, weather and climate, uh, but I'll, I'll beaver away at that and, and we'll get there. And I, for me, what's happening in our climate is, is it's about extremes one way or t'other, it's, it's about extremes. Um, and this is what I guess we're all expecting to come and, and uh, experiencing already. So unless the people at the, at the party in Egypt uh, can help continue to get their act together, um, we need to think about uh, and do what we can as individuals, of course, but uh, hope, and, and always read a book from Colin Powell, hope, hope is not a method. Um, when I say hope that our governments and our uh, business people do, industrial people do the right thing for us. This is a, a disturbing fact, and, and Helen did mention this too, but heat waves actually kill more people than pretty much any other natural disaster. And uh, it's something to be considered. We've already had our first heat waves in Northwest Queensland, right through to the coast 
Townsville, Cairns uh, already this year, uh, when for many Queenslanders, uh, and I'm born and bred Queenslander, it's probably the coldest winter I've felt in Brisbane for a long time, but I was born in Townsville, so I'm a North Queenslander. But uh, heat is a big problem, uh, particularly for urban environments, when uh, particularly our elderly are living in inappropriate homes, not dealt with heat, and actually more worried about crime. So everything's locked and they're not getting that airflow. So um, that is one of the, the uh, natural disasters, if you like, that's just going to become more troublesome. The other factor that we've experienced, um, particularly for 2018 and 19 was the most recent, but the seasons we've noticed definitely extending and uh, becoming much more severe. And we've started to hear terms in the last 10 years or so from people like uh, Stephen Pine, who's a fire ecologist in, uh, in the US, um, where the words megafire have been used. And that came into Australia, particularly probably after Black Saturday in Victoria, the word, and I'll, and I'll tell you why that's important in a moment, megafires. Uh, observed trends in FFDI, which is Forest Fire Danger Index. Um, and again, this is back in 20 and we've had, had a couple of good seasons, so it, it will certainly be different. But the Forest Fire Danger Index and the Grass Fire Danger Index were the uh, indexes that were used by the Bureau to put out the fire warnings about um, fire conditions that are expected. Now, they have changed recently, and I'll talk to you about those very shortly. So they, they were the means of uh, estimating um, the seriousness of fire. And as you can see, even in Queensland, uh, which traditionally has not had the same bushfire problem as our southern and southeastern uh, states. We've, we've got plenty of uh, problems ahead there. Rainfall, uh, I was interested to hear Helen talk about the rainfall being much more highly variable rather than one way or other. Um, and leading up to the 2018 and 19 seasons in Queensland, we experienced right in the middle of a very extensive drought and primarily the antecedent conditions for any major bushfire in Australia has been extensive drought. That, that's just how it rolls. The new Australian fire danger rating system that's uh, just been operationalized uh, last month, I think, um, is now uh, broken down only into four categories, moderate, high, extreme, and catastrophic. Uh, there were two other categories in the previous system. And we'll see that in a minute. Uh, I, do, I do use the word catastrophic in a different way in a lot of ways. I, I call it the catastrophization of weather by the media. And if you've just experienced the, the most recent events that we've had, the, the amount of media that the world is going to end, that the sky is going to fall in on us through print and media, I think, drives people to, yeah, anyway. I think in some ways it's difficult challenge because sometimes to get people to respond to emergency warnings, particularly bushfire in Queensland, is difficult. Unless there's smoke in front of your face, most people are too busy with their lives and just ignore it. So, but my personal view is I think some of the media um, overplays it. So these categories, uh, the fire danger rating system is related now to what's called the fire behavior index. And, and the first two ratings are no longer on the new scale. And these ratings are made up, the, the scores, if you like, of the index are made up of uh, 
different vegetation types. The new system, I think, is going to cover about six different vegetation types across Australia, and rather than simply forest fire or grass fire, and all the way up to catastrophic. Now, the original uh, danger index never went past 100, and that was uh, brought out by a scientist called MacArthur with the CSIRO in the 60s. So the highest the danger index went to was 100. Catastrophic didn't exist. And post Black Saturday fires again in Victoria, that index was changed to go over 100. And now uh, this system is using a lot more vegetation types to try and get a far more accurate indication of, of, of the conditions. And uh, later on, if you want to know more about the actual workings or detail of that, I can talk to you and show you the best site to go and look at, look at that if you're interested in finding out a bit more about it. The Australian uh, warning system is also- Very good, thanks, how are you? Who was that? <laughs> Might have been somebody online asking something, I don't know. Um, the, the Australian warning system has changed and been modified. I'll, I'll oh, just focus you. on uh, bushfire with the icons related to advice, yellow, watch and act, and emergency warning. And you would have heard the media messaging that comes out based on those systems. And we're using all those icons now for the other types of natural hazards. And again, I can reference you uh, a, a good site um, through the Australian Fire uh, and Emergency Authorities Council that would give you more understanding of that. Uh, <laughs> Yep, thank you. Um, so basically, this is again linked to what Helen's talk was about, is that we're expecting obviously um, many, many more days in the future of very high fire danger index and uh, relative, in our case, back to uh, 1990. Talked about longer fire seasons. Um, why that's problematic is that all of the states share resourcing. So uh, as you might realize, the fire season starts in Northern Australia uh, in late winter, spring, and moves its way through Australia until in, in Victoria with sort of Mediterranean climate, that uh, high summer time. So we are able to, assist mainly the, us going to support them in New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, that's becoming more difficult because resources are now committed and tied up because of the longer, longer overlapping seasons. Um, I won't read all of those, but the one on the bottom there, this idea and concept of extreme fires, mega fires, People might remember the first fire tornado that we really focused on from the Canberra fires, about 2003, something like that. So that's happening where uh, these bushfires are creating their own weather systems, basically. They're creating their own thunderstorm uh, weather conditions that are, are causing major fire spread at rapid rate of knots across large and if you can recall the 19 fires, particularly in southeastern um, New South Wales and northeastern Victoria, uh, the fire spread was just incredible. And the amount of uh, square kilometres that were burnt is, is really frightening. One of the things about this from the fire point of view is more than 
it's probably about, I'll round it out, about 300,000 firefighters in Australia. At least 250,000 of those are volunteers. So there's not, you know, there's probably about 20,000 or maybe a bit more now professional firefighters or part-time firefighters. But like many aspects of Australian society, volunteers are relied on significantly in the emergency services. And um, one of the things about that is all of this activity is now followed by compounding disasters. So again, 2019, fires followed by floods, particularly in New South Wales, devastating floods. And the same people are being called out the same regional areas of Australia are being devastated. Can you imagine the psychological impacts on people? And it's not just emergency service volunteers, it's people like CWA, church groups, all sorts of other support groups in society, and mainly in regional Australia, feeling major impacts. This, this is becoming a terrible problem, it's affecting the welfare of volunteers, whether they be volunteer firefighters, volunteer SES, volunteer Red Cross, the capacity of people to deal with what seems to be just rolling, compounding disasters hitting communities. Can you imagine living in Lismore? It's just beyond comprehension in a lot of ways, how people are dealing with it, the homelessness, the, the impact. So. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention, and we might hear a bit more about this later today, is smoke. 434 people died from the effects of smoke following the 2019 fires that were recorded. So people uh, with breathing difficulties, breathing problems, health problems suffer as well. Sorry, <laughs> you're, you're on. I don't want to put my back to you too much. Oops. In Queensland, our experience uh, was certainly, we weren't used to what happened in 2018 and 19 here in the state. But certainly the fire behaviour was much more like what we regularly see in New South Wales and Victoria particularly, but also South Australia, Tassie and Western Australia. Major damage to property loss, we generally, don't lose a lot of buildings. We lose fences, outbuildings, some machinery, uh, but we lost uh, a record number of dwellings and, and buildings and a major impact on agriculture, of course. And we certainly had some bad seasons over, over different years. There's no doubt about that, but nothing like what happened. Since 2002, um, I attended the fire at Ballandine in, in, um, at, just out of Stanthorpe, and I was newly minted uh, fire commissioner. We lost six houses at that fire. One person, civilian, was killed, and a rural fire service volunteer was badly burnt. But in those days, um, there was very limited coordination between urban firefighters and rural firefighters. There were no communications that were suitable. There were no joined up incident management systems that everybody used. And I came away from there basically shaking in my boots thinking, we're gonna kill people. We're gonna kill our own people because uh, there was lack of coordination. So since then, there's been a lot of work gone on about improving the systems that, um, that are used. Uh, I was president uh, for four years of the Australasian Fire Emergency Service Authorities Council. Uh, we updated and introduced the Australasian Inter-Service Incident Management System, which is the command and control system, if you like, that's used by uh, emergency services. And all of that has been implemented and Queensland is very well equipped and continues to evolve uh, in improving in that area. But we did uh, have a long road uh, to go because fire wasn't 
seen as a big problem. It's not the number one natural hazard for Queensland. Storms, floods, cyclones uh, far outweigh, but what I'm here to convince you today is that bushfire is on the way up um, because the conditions following all this rain are going to provide wonderful vegetation in probably two years time uh, if the dry returns and I'm fairly confident it will. Um, this is just part of the overall climate uh, situation and, and I think the message fundamentally from me is um, more, much more variability in everything that we experience. And again, if for my ground zero, if you like, from 2006 from Larry, it's really been just continuous and I don't see that, see that back, backing off. And adaptation to this is, is a, a huge, huge challenge for us all. Um, thanks. <laughs> Better keep moving. Um, I won't cover this too much because Helen covered some of that about the barrier reef and climate. Um, the outlook uh, from the bomb. Normal bushfire potential in eastern states, but elevated grass fire in southern Australia. That's for this year. Um, prolonged heat waves, severe thunderstorms. So uh, from a bushfire point of view, um, fairly, fairly steady. I think uh, from previous memory, they are forecasting an increased number of cyclones this year. And uh, we'll see what happens with that. And uh, my feeling is we must be overdue for something that really impacts, unfortunately. Um, and with the current setup, three years of La Nina, and it's probably right. Storms, um, yeah, we, we should be right into that in Queensland right now, November on, um, we're gonna cop it. Uh, just quickly from my point of view, uh, for the future, we need to use fire in the landscape is my position. And one of the things that we've consistently ignored obviously is indigenous knowledge because the science of biodiversity <coughs> regard fire ecology is probably only 70 years old. And we ignored it in 1776 or whatever it was. Um, and we ignored our own peril about managing the landscape. And from the fire service point of view, those who own the land own the fire problem. And obviously government owns a lot of land. And um, what I'll say about that is, our colleagues in government agencies need more support because people in parks and places like that, you might see a lot of publicity about government gifting or taking control of land and gifting it to the parks department to look after. And they say, thank you very much. But the estate that they're managing now is huge and they just don't have the resources to do it, do it properly. Um, Couple of points there and I'm conscious of time now. Indigenous burning is burnt basically from my perspective for cultural biodiversity and to keep the country clean. Land managers are burning for biodiversity, generally community asset protection. From a CUFAS point of view, it's about protecting life, protecting property and environment. Remembering that CUFAS doesn't own any land. It's not a government land management agency in that sense. And private, like pri private forestry and private groups looking after their asset, uh, primary production and biodiversity. They have similar objectives, but not necessarily the same. And for me, the whole question of climate change comes here. For me, it's actually about we should pollute less. Because once we damage our land, once we uh, kill our air supply off and our water supply, water and land particularly, we've got no hope. 
can't grow food, can't breathe properly, um, we're in trouble. So the concept of climate change in my head is, is centered around pollution. Um, obviously other people have different viewpoints. And I'll keep moving. I'll, we've covered that. Um, just a shot from your poon. I'll just leave that slide up there and happy to finish there and take any questions. So do we have questions from the floor? Uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, a very good talk. But uh, looking further ahead with the problems we've had in the past and the slow reaction, uh, partly because of the recruitment of volunteers and the lack of coordination, which you referred to, how do you feel about a complete change of concept where, uh, like the Second World War responses in emergencies, where you had aircraft airborne and ready to drop water the moment that there is a flower outbreak, rather than waiting something up to 24 hours before you get the people on the ground and then temperatures perhaps are too, far, uh, too hot to work in and uh, too late to establish fire breaks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the use of aerial firefighting essentially I'll respond to in that part of your question. Um, aerial firefighting in Australia is, is fairly mature now. Um, I can remember the first day in the early 2000s that I signed the order for Queensland to start using helicopters. And the thing I said to staff around us, once we start, there's no going back. And that's every year since it's more expensive. Anybody that knows anything to do with aircraft is it's extremely expensive and government agencies uh, directly in my opinion, should not own them, and which we don't in, in the um, fire world. Uh, NAFSI, which is the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, which was a member of the board for that for a number of years, um, coordinates the procurement of firefighting resources for Australia, and each state does, does their own as well. Queensland would only spend 15 to $20 million a year on aircraft for firefighting. New South Wales spends $80 million a year just on that retardant that comes out of the aircraft. That's not the aircraft, that's just the retardant. So basically firefighting, aerial firefighting is much more heavily utilised. There's people all over Australia who are accredited and trained to coordinate and call that resource out as quickly as uh, your concept was they're in the air all the time. Um, I don't know that that's sustainable, but aircraft are heavily used based on what's happened in California though. In California, there's more aircraft than probably the Royal Australian Air Force and a few other air forces together because they have got the wherewithal to do that. Queensland has some very good providers, McDermott's on the Sunshine Coast, helicopter provider, works all over the world. Um, and it's a seasonal thing. So aircraft are brought to Australia from America, primarily North America, um, but that has problems as well with their seasons extending. So there's pressures on that all the time, but there is increasing use of aircraft and much higher levels nationally coordinated. Uh, one of the things that climate action people lobbied the previous government for was, um, it was John Howard in 2003, I think, after the Sydney, Sydney bushfires in that year, initiated the first Commonwealth grant to help fund aircraft. It was $15 million. And it stayed that way until 2019, the same amount of money, $15 million. And we lobbied for an increase, which it has now. Uh, but New South Wales and Victoria had spent $150 million each a year on aircraft. So it's very expensive. Um, and unfortunately, 2019, there was an American air crew, a Hercules killed in southeastern New South Wales. So they are used and it's increasingly so.
Mr. <coughs> Mr. Johnson, thank you for that. Can I suggest you've only just started the conversation? A couple of comments and, and maybe mixed questions. One, California seemed to lead the world in the 60s in an understanding of fire. Their comment was from memory was something like little fires every year are a lot better than the sort of the catastrophic one every 10 years. They seem to have forgotten that. The question is why? If we come to Australia, and I suppose an extension of that, if we look at our paleo record in terms of climate, it's been sort of you know, enormously varied, but the indigenous arrived here about 65,000 years ago, changed our landscape completely. Do we understand the dynamics of the landscape? If I give you an example, say in the last 10 years, we went from a, a record flood, a flood to a record drought, back to record flood again. In my area, my area near Roma, uh, dry period of dry years, heavy stocking, we always overstock. Suddenly the, fire, the, the stock numbers decreased, culminated in the 19 drought. And because we'd suppressed fire from the public lands, enormous buildup of trees, in some areas 100% died. And they were mm -hmm. the invasive species. Go to the Brigalow land, the Mulga land, suggestions are they were open grasslands. The indigenous knew how to manage it for their aims. I'm not sure they're our, our, our aim because burning releases carbon, no matter how, how you do it. Do we need a better understanding of the landscape? And is the government ever going to aware that they are responsible for the public lands and they have a duty also to a certain extent? And I don't think they do. I just see the stock routes completely overgrown. Their primary purpose is uh, moving stock. Most of the stock routes I've seen, you can't even find the stock in them. There's a fair bit in that. <laughs> um, that's why I stopped there. <laughs> thank you. Um, no, I don't think we do. And that's why I mentioned about when we haven't taken enough experience from the indigenous culture about how our landscape was made it's a fire uh, regime that's gone through now uh, that's not going to happen today the way it was of course but um, going back to the California example for a while it was smoky bear put every fire out then what happened because of that there wasn't enough natural fire went through now they've got this beetle that's killed huge swathes of those forests on the uh, west coast of America. And that leads to the super hot fires, which kill everything. So um, I know Parks and Wildlife had a, a scheme and they would copped a fair bit of criticism from landholders over the years, but there is a good neighbour policy scheme now. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about people thinking they couldn't but weren't allowed to burn certain tracts of land. You know, two things. One is people on the land should uh, get together with the parks people more often where they can. But two, parks people just don't have enough resources. That's why I mentioned that it's great to lock up a lot of land. Absolutely fantastic. But if you don't manage it, it just becomes a mega problem at some point. And um, I a bit off the track, sorry, but I'm a big fan of regenerative agriculture. Um, I see that as, as a positive way forward from an agricultural uh, cattle particularly area. But um, yeah, understanding the landscape, people like Queensland Fire and Fire and Biodiversity Forum are doing a lot of work in that space as well. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there at the moment. I think we're yeah, any other questions from the floor? Our morning tea was a little bit late coming in, so we're just checking that it's ready. And we'll certainly uh, welcome you to morning tea as soon as it's ready, but it's just next yeah. door, so it's not far. I'm still um, here. Okay. We've got the message that it is ready, but we'll just take this Probably, gentleman's yeah. final question before we have a break. Thank you. Yeah, there was a lot of talk about hazard reduction burning and cultural burning around about the time of the Black Summer. My fear is that cultural burning worked in the Holocene, which is the era that humans have prospered in. It may not work in the Anthropocene, which is what we're going into now. I mean, you can hazard reduction burn till you've got a bare forest floor. If you've got catastrophic fires conditions, then it's going to go through the treetops and uh, 
no amount of hazard reduction burning will help you. Greg Mullins makes that point in his book, uh, the, the Firestorm. So, yeah. so I'm just wondering, uh, is hazard reduction, I think uh, hazard reduction burning should be pursued, but in catastrophic fire situations, does it do any good? Um, I think we're actually, according to the, I think he's a professor, Stephen Pine, we're actually going to the Pyrocene, the age of fire. And um, cultural burning, as I just said before, it's not going to ever happen in the way it used to. No. Um, if you go back and, and look at the uh, diaries and, and books about the first explorers of Australia, I I read a couple of other, uh, the Dark Emmy book and another one about the landscape, and I kept reading these references about what the landscape looked like when the first people came to us, white people came to Australia, and then I went back and read Sturt Mitchell, and it was unbelievable how it, they said it was like it was maintained by a, an English parkway in some cases. Mm. So that's not going to come again because one of the points that was up on the slide is property boundary, tenure. And property boundaries are nothing to fire. They don't mean a thing. And that's why when we're trying to get uh, better land management practices, you have to bring a collaborative group that is not worried about tenure and you only burn, you know, a little patch. You, you, with biodiversity as, as a consideration, of course, You've got to burn larger areas on a regular pattern. But at the end of the day, if the conditions build up like you pointed to, when it comes to catastrophic fire, just get out of its way and save lives. That's, that's it. The other thing about that fire behaviour index is essentially above 50 index points, or probably even a little less, no direct fire attack can take place. You can't put anybody in front of that fire. You can only work the edges, try and put retardant, put fire bombers in to slow it, try and steer it. You can't put uh, uh, people in the way of that fire to do anything about it at all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Lee, for a very um, interesting and inter interpretation of that. Thank you. Um, I think his first point, you know, in the summer we're in now, La Nina, don't forget about fire because it's still going to be around. Now, um, I understand our morning tea is ready. So could I ask you, go out this door, just here that where you came in, just turn to the right straight through into the Global Change Institute atrium. That's where the morning tea is set up. And I'll give you a bell at um, 10 to 11. So if you could come back then. Uh, sorry, 10 to 12, <laughs> thanks. Okay, thank you everyone. I hope you enjoyed the morning tea. So that's um, that's good. So um, welcome back again. Now our next presenter, Ella Harrison, unfortunately she came down with a, a bug yesterday, but the good news is she's going to present to us her um, present presentation via Zoom. So we're going to just uh, watch, but there will be opportunities as usual for questions. Um, at the end, so uh, we can we can still accommodate that. So over to Ella, I think. Um, I'll introduce her a little bit more. So Ella is from the Queensland Reconstruction Authority, where she is director of flood risk management. So eminently appropriate for this talk and from fire to flood of course this morning so I think without further ado we'll um, you've got Ella's bio with you you can read a little more about her and we'll try to get her now um, on zoom thank you 
Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. I will um, bring up my presentation. So yes, I'm presenting on flood risk in response to is Queensland prepared for a warming climate? Um, Ella Harrison, Director of Flood Risk Management within Resilience and Recovery at the Queensland Reconstruction Authority. I'll just start with an acknowledgement of country. The QRA acknowledges Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owners and custodians of the land. We recognise their connection to land, sea and community and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. So for those of, that, of you that don't know, Queensland Reconstruction Authority began following the South East Queensland 2011 floods. Since we were born, uh, there's been 100 significant disaster events in Queensland. There was 10 this last season alone. We, there's been 20 billion spent in recovery and reconstruction of which 2 billion was from this most recent season. So as you can see, we're getting pretty good at responding to and recovering from disaster events of which flood is our most significant natural hazard. Just thought I'd bring this up quickly just to summarise the findings of the World Economic Forum at the global scale, what is our evolving risk landscape and consistently extreme weather and climate change action failure have featured in the top five. And this is again in 2022, the order dances around a little bit, but then usually one and two and for very good reason. So what will the warmer climate mean for flood risk? And we do have some uncertainty. There is a general consensus that will mean more frequent extremes, but how that actually affects flooding is variable. Um, and it really depends on the catchment and its ability to absorb change. So I'll just give you a very quick flood engineering crash course for those of you who may not be so familiar. We look at hydraulics, which converts the rainfall into runoff and then hydraulics, which moves that runoff across the land. A 1% annual exceedance probability design event, what does that actually mean? It means in any given year, there is a 1% chance of a flood of that size of larger occurring when you consider over a very long period of time. So a couple of key points there, it is any year. It doesn't matter what's happened the year before or the 10 years prior, every year has the same probability and you need to consider it over a very long period of time. We're talking 10,000 years or more. So when people see the clustering of events that we've experienced recently, there tends to be a bit of um, dialogue that the 1% is wrong. It's just, it's looking at too short of a time period. Do we get our um, understanding of modelling, sorry, our understanding of flooding from models. And it's important to understand that models do make assumptions and approximations of real world. So they'll never be perfect, but they'll be good enough for us to use and draw conclusions from. And again, design events themselves are derived from historical information which needs to be extrapolated. So that means we need an understanding of what the path happened in the past to infer what might happen in the future. And of course, climate change puts some uncertainty on that part. We look at things like the depth of flooding, the level, the velocity, the hazard and the flow. And we measure flow in what's called QMEX, so metres cubed per second, which is a bit of an abstract concept for some people. So try to imagine a moving box, which is about a metre by a metre by a metre, which weighs a tonne. And if you need help, a tonne is approximately a baby whale. So when we talk about QMEX, it's a one tonne cubic, one tonne um, cardboard box, basically. And flood risk is the combination of both the probability of the hazard occurring and its behaviour and the consequence. So critically, what that means is flooding is only a problem when people get in the way. So if we have a look at what climate change might mean for flooding in the Queensland context, I um, quickly jump on the Brisbane River catchment, not only as the place where I live and work, but it's also a catchment I've been studying for the last six years. So we know that the Brisbane River can contain about 4,000 QMEX within its banks. So that's 4,000 of those cardboard boxes weighing a tonne going past you every single second can stay in bank. Anything more than that and the waters will start to break the bunks and we'll call it a flood. If we go back to 2011, it was approximately a 1% event, so a 1 in 100, and that equals about 9,000 cubic, cubic metres per second. And that's nowhere near as big as it can get. So we need to understand that the Brisbane River is a very big catchment with the possibility for very large floods. And so then if we look at the consequence, what happens when it floods? Um, here's some of the research that came out of the Brisbane River Strategic Flood Plain Management Plan published by the state government in 2019. So this graph on the left shows you the number of buildings in the floodplain for a range of design events. We think it's about 12,000 properties get impacted by one in 100. 
If you look at the expected tangible costs, so just those that we can easily put a dollar value towards, we're looking at about 5 billion for every time a 1% flood occurs. But if you look at the average annual damages, so looking at the full range of floods and weighting it by year, we're looking at about $290 million per year from flooding in the Brisbane River catchment. And the interesting thing about that is this little pie trap on the bottle, on the bottom, about a third of that occurs for floods which are smaller than the 1 in 100, and then a third is for those floods that are just between the 1 in 100 and 1 in 500, and then the remaining third is when you get larger. So we've done quite good at managing the floods up to the 1 in 100, and then things get quite scary if they get bigger. So what does climate change mean for the Brisbane River and the impact on floodings? And basically the research we've shown is you basically double the probability. So where it was a 1% chance of every year, it becomes a 2% chance of those 9,000 baby whales going past you every second. And it's important to think about Cumex because sometimes people underestimate what water and the power it has. I think because we use it every day, we drink it, bathe in it, swim in it, we um, can be a little bit surprised at the power it has and the ability to move houses off their stumps, to destroy buildings, to destroy bridges and to take lives. And it's not just about the size of the flood and flood behaviour, but it's also how high those levels are. And so again, the research from the SFMP showed under different climate change scenarios, we could be looking at metres of increase. So where before we thought a one in 100, um, maybe a certain size under climate change scenarios, it could be one to two metres higher again. And that's an awful lot of change for our legacy development to absorb. For those of you that are visual, this map shows the dark red areas where we're anticipating an increase of more than two metres under some climate change scenarios. And so, as you can see, that covers swathes of our developed areas. These are existing houses, existing developments, which have the probability of a large flood doubling and the consequences increasing by more than two metres. So that then draws to the question of are we ready? And I guess from the QRA's perspective, we've been practicing for the last 10 years about recovery and resilience, and we've learned a lot in that time. We have evolved our thinking from a recovery siloed kind of approach to a systems approach, being proactively planned and resilient recovery. We have very strong relationships with our local governments. We rely on the locally led, regionally coordinated, state facilitated approach. We have collected and created a lot of data and information and we use that for evidence-based planning and decision making. We identify and link local priorities to the funding streams and we're always looking for continuous improvement. Some of these initiatives that have evolved over the last 10 years, the Queensland Betterment Fund now looks at not only reconstruction to how it was but making it more resilient and so since 2013 when it first started rolling out, 245 million has been spent on almost 500 projects Many of these projects have been impacted by subsequent disasters and the avoided cost is about 250 million. So this means when we build back roads or water treatment works or sewage treatment plants, we're trying to make them more resilient. So the next times it happens, the impacts are far less severe. We've also had case studies of trying to manage our legacy development. I'm sure all of you are familiar with Grantham and following 2011, there was a um, major undertaking between the QRA and the Lockyer Valley called Relocating Grantham. We um, acquired 935 acre site and offered it to people for a land swap. So they gave us their old land, we gave them new land and they built a house. And this was a highly successful uh, program with a lot of uh, high uptake. And I think the 2022 events show the success of these types of program. It's a perhaps a bit hard to see without a pointer, but of the 100 homes that we built in the new Grantham estate, none of them were impacted in 2022. And of those who remained in old Grantham, 32 houses were affected by the flooding, including 19 with moderate damage and 13 with minor damage. So this just shows that managing the consequences of flooding is highly effective. From this, we've also looked at how we can make our built form more resilient to a range of disasters. So we have the flood resilient guideline. We also have a cyclone resilient, storm tide and bushfire resilient guideline. So with this, we're trying to advance our built form to be more place-based appropriate and responding to the natural hazards that, that affect the area. We also engage in annual get ready activities and, and research to try and understand how our communities understand their risk and how prepared they are. And this is the results from the 2022 
about half of the people in disaster areas have an emergency kit, about two thirds have an emergency plan, nearly 60% have registered for those local emergency alerts and more, about 85% have building contents insurance. However, for about 40% of people, they feel that their risk is too low or it's just not top of mind and 10% feel that they have enough time when warnings are given. And the drivers for change are really that um, in, when a disaster strikes. So the, the threat needs to be there for there to be a response. 20% relying on ongoing reminders and incentives and 26 on really specific information on what they need to do and how to do it. So this season, 2022, 21-22 was exhausting to say the least. As I mentioned, we had nine events in that short period of time, including the 2022 Southeast Queensland rainfall and running flooding. I think it um, is a catalytic season and we have managed to acquire, like I mentioned, two billion in recovery programs from this event season, but we've changed what we're looking at. So you might've heard of the Resilient Homes Fund. So this time, not only are we wanting people to build back, we want them to build back better, either through a resilient household program using our guideline to make it more waterproof, uh, sorry, um, yeah, wet proof, that is let the water in, but it's quicker to clean up. We're looking at raising homes where it's most appropriate to do so. And in some places we need to buy those homes back. We need to take away the risk of that house being flooded again. We've also got a 10 million property level flood information portal program rolling out, which will see all of the 39 councils have the opportunity to install a um, web-based system that will allow community to look up their address and understand their flood risk. Since it opened in May, and these stats change very quickly, we've had about 5,000 registrations of interest of the 7,000 homes that we know were impacted. There's more than 500 for buyback, about 1,500 for house raising and nearly 2,000 for resilient retrofit. And that program is well underway. We have selected 278 programs, sorry, 278 properties to buy back and the home assessment process is rolling out. That's probably a highlight from this season, but we've also got 28 million for our flood risk management package. So this is to better understand the hazard and develop those risk mitigation strategies and plans to respond to the consequence and to ensure that we become more disaster resilient. And so now we go to the, the real question, is Queensland ready? And I think to say a lot of work is underway to try and ensure we have that safer future. But the thing that keeps me up at night is the new challenges that we've we just haven't experienced before or haven't um, thought about happening. A lot of what we do has this underlying assumption that history is a predictor of the future and what is now will continue. And I mean that not only from a hydrologic perspective and our, how our cycles work and how floodings occur, but also from society. If we have ongoing seasons like we have now, they have compounding, cascading and lingering effects. You know, personally, the fatigue of having been in response and recovery mode for a year is exhausting and that is felt across society. And this is just about flood. What happens if we have sustained attacks? So it's a bushfire season and then a flood season and then it's a drought. And so those are the types of challenges which I actually think um, are the ones that are going to catch us off guard if we're not better prepared and are going to really test us. And so, like I said, if it was just floods, I think we're actually on the right track. We know what we need to do and we're implementing those strategies. And I think there's a real step change in um, people's acceptance of flooding and that we need to do things differently. But it's how it's all interacts. That's the really great unknown. And we need that multifaceted, multidisciplinary systems approach to tackling the challenges of climate change. This can't be a siloed response and we can't rely on history being the predictor of the future. And that's me, thank you. Were there any questions on that one? Oh, thank you very much, Ella. And uh, as I said before, Ella, very pleased that she could present to us today. She wasn't feeling well at all yesterday. Ella, thank you so much. And we do hope you're feeling better today. Thank you. Um, are you hoping to, uh, are you able to take a few questions from the yeah, floor? Yeah, of course. And yeah. we'll look to see if there are any on Zoom. I don't think there are at the moment, but uh, questions from the floor first over there. Thanks. Just getting the microphone to the person. First of all, thank you for letting me have so many questions. A question to Ella, two questions. One, um, again, I go on the 
paleoclimate record, the 1730 floods were higher than the 1841. What would happen if we had a 1730 flood again, plus increasing urban sprawl with high peak floods? And two, we had coincide with a tornado or a cyclone. Are, are we ready for such an extreme event, which is quite likely, but in any case of when? Second question is, I went to a little forum there last week about flood, and it was interesting. You suggest we should have house insurance. Their comment was house insurance had a lot of problems. One, you had to wait for the assessor to come, and that I think one case took nine months. They'd looked at it objectively and said, we should raise our house. The people that tried to raise their house, they could because there was a, a height limit. And, wow. and if they'd done what they wanted to do, they would have been out of the flood level. Two, they got rid of gyp rock and put uh, fibro walls in. And three, they put um, polished floors in with carpet. So it was uh, you know, a lot easier to clean up. And the fourth one they said was, make sure you open your fridge's door as you leave, because you leave them closed, they float around and do, and, and do a lot of damage. Uh. Okay, well, uh, Ella, did you were you able to hear the question? Yeah, perfect. And, okay, um, so let's take the first one, um, which is I think about um, you know extreme events going back quite a long way. Would you like to comment on that one? Yeah, of course. And so, in uh, contemporary flood risk management, we definitely look at the full range of events. So I, I could bring it back. That slide that I showed you, we look at the very frequent, but also the the largest possible, which is called the probable maximum flood. So we have an understanding of the scale of an event like that and what might need to happen to manage it. We do do black swan exercises, which is the response and recovery agencies come together to try and exercise the unimaginable, though it will always be more challenging than we expect. And so I guess the, the answer in Brisbane, it will be catastrophic. And like I said, it will probably lead to systems failure. It won't just be a flood problem. It will be health and society and so forth. And it will be dramatic. The Brisbane River catchment is very, very risky. Um, can we reasonably mitigate the consequence of that? And the answer is no, not unless we abandon the floodplain. And we seem to have made a commitment to be here and we just need to do the best we can. But from a flood engineer's perspective, we absolutely look at the extreme, unlikely, but high consequence events to try and understand what we could do. Moving on to the other one about insurance, um, that was actually just a metric of awareness. If people are willing to invest in insurance, they must be aware that there's a risk. And so it was interesting to note that 85% had insurance. I agree, it's not a silver bullet. I don't think there is a single answer to managing this. Um, insurance in some places can help those people get back quicker. So where there's damage that they weren't able to avoid, they can get back, but also it can create a sense of it's okay to be here. So insurance alone isn't the answer. And I think some of the points you talked about lead to the resilient design. So this idea of your house might get wet, but how can we make sure that the cleanup afterwards is as quick as possible? So choosing the right materials that can have periods of inundation, raising your um, electrical uh, switchboards and so forth so they don't get inundated as frequently is the type of stuff that we're rolling out through the Resilient Homes program at the moment. Oh, thank you, Ella. We did actually try to get a speaker from the insurance industry to present to our forum today, but it was unsuccessful. Um, I think uh, we came to the conclusion perhaps that uh, it would be a little... Um, they would re maybe regard it as a bit threatening. <laughs> and also but, they're probably um, quite busy at the minute. <laughs> and they are very busy at the moment. So yes, insurance is certainly, um, you know, a major aspect of, of all of this, um, um, trying to adapt to climate change, bush, bushfire and, and floods as well, certainly. So um, the whole aspect of insurance is certainly one in the background, very important, very critical. Any more questions from the floor? Do we have any from the chat? No. No? All right, well, we might let Ella go and rest. And again, Ella, thank you so much for agreeing to do it. We do hope you're feeling better. <laughs> And uh, again, thanks for presenting to us this morning. Very, very valuable. Thank you. See you later. Okay, so next is our uh, presentation on health. And I will introduce Sue Cook in, in a moment. We'll just get her presentation up.
Yeah, since Ella's presentation was a little bit shorter, we do have plenty of time here. Our lunch break is from one o'clock. So uh, it's now 20 past 12. So we do have plenty of time. Um, if you have questions for Sue, there will be plenty of time. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's not. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's not mine. That's it, that's it. Do you want Sue to put on the microphone? I'll, I'll continue to run it. If you want to move away, to yes, if you stick closer, that's fine. This will, um, you can use uh, the mouse to okay. advance your slides, or you can use this one. All right, so just leave it here. Right, I'll try that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let me see. That's your there second you one. Oh, okay, so it is actually moving on. Yeah, it does. Okay, yeah. that's right. Perfect. So you can use that. This is confusing. But if you stand there, the there you, it will be, uh, it's okay. Okay. All right, are you yep. okay? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone, and, and thank you for having me here today. Here. Okay. <laughs> testing, testing. No, Still no good. How's that? Okay, good. So, um, yes, thanks for having me here this afternoon. Um, as uh, Arachne said, I'm from Griffith University where I uh, do some research with the Climate Action Beacon, but I'm also speaking this afternoon from my perspective as a volunteer and sometime uh, consultant for the Climate and Health Alliance which is the peak body for climate and health in Australia. And it has over 80 professional bodies, health and health and medical professional bodies as members, representing over 600,000 health professionals. Um, I'll start with an acknowledgement to country too. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting the Turrbal and Jagera people and pay my respects also to their elders past and present. And I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's very unsustainable. I feel very bad standing here with all these pages of paper, which I printed out because I was worried I wouldn't be able to see my notes. Um, so what I plan to touch on this afternoon is an overview of climate impacts on health, uh, focusing then on Australia and then more specifically on Queensland and a little tiny incursion into health policy responses that are happening or that are uh, required. Until fairly recently, um, people haven't automatically connected climate change with health impacts. But over a decade ago, both the, um, the World Health Organization and the respected medical journal, The Lancet, uh, were saying that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. And many health and medical organizations are now speaking out very um, loudly, saying that climate change is a health emergency. And uh, Professor Richard Horton said in The Lancet, we are now living in a period of accelerating risk, which I think we have heard this morning, I'm sure you've all heard very strongly. But we also know that um, tackling climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. And we have many solutions at hand uh, to reduce the health risks associated with climate change, but much more action is needed. Um, economic analysis shows that better air quality alone would lead to enough health benefits and saved health costs to easily offset the global cost of emissions reduction. So climate solutions benefit our health and our economy, making them win-win-win solutions. 
actions. But of course, it's not only climate change that's threatening our health. Of the nine planetary uh, boundaries that scientists have identified to define a safe operating space for humanity, climate change and biosphere integrity are core boundaries, meaning that significantly altering either of these core boundaries would drive the Earth as a system into a new state, one much less hospitable to us and our health and well-being. And we're already transgressing several of those boundaries. So the concept of planetary health has emerged, defined as the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. And infectious disease and planetary health experts tell us that the COVID-19 crisis and the climate and biodiversity crises are deeply connected and we should pay much stronger attention. But just dealing with climate change for the moment, these last two sentences of the latest IPCC report, Summary for Policymakers, are a powerful up to the minute assessment of the current situation, saying the cumulative scientific evidence is unequivocal, climate change is a threat to human well being and planetary health, and any further delay in concerted anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. So the report notes that climate related illnesses, premature deaths, malnutrition in all its forms and threats to mental health and well being are increasing. Climate hazards are growing are a growing driver of involuntary migration and displacement and are a contributing factor to violent conflict. And this is an increasing um, concern in this, in this latest report. But it also says that with proactive and timely effective adaptation, many risks for human health and well-being could be reduced and some could be avoided potentially. So it talks more about climate resilient development, um, which is uh, adaptation plus mitigation plus action on the, the 17 um, sustainable development goals. So climate resilient development has a strong potential to generate substantial benefits to health and well-being, um, and to reduce those risks of displacement and conflict. So it's not too late, but we're starting from a long way behind that we need to do an awful lot more, a lot better and a lot faster. So let's take a look at how climate change does impact on health. And I know you've, you've heard probably quite a bit of this this morning, but the direct impacts include more extreme weather, for example, heat waves. And he, this, the latest report says that heat is a growing health risk due to burgeoning urbanization, that's more people in the way of heat, more high temperature extremes, higher highs, and countries with aging populations. And we're already experiencing heat stress conditions at or approaching the upper limits of labor productivity in some regions. So extreme heat has negative impacts on mental health, well-being, life satisfaction, happiness, the way our brains function, cognitive performance, and aggression. And more Australians already die every year. You may have heard this statistic, but more Australians die from heat every year than from all other natural disasters put together. And as our climate shifts, we're seeing more deaths and hospitalizations for heat stress and more admissions for kidney failure and heart attacks, as well as heat stroke. Since 2009, emergency departments across Australia have experienced increased chronic health conditions uh, presentations such as cardiovascular, heart, kidney, renal, respiratory illnesses during periods of prolonged heat and for the couple of days afterwards, for the few days afterwards. So uh, emergency department presentations for sunburn have increased by 50%, increasing the risk of, sick, of skin cancer too. And it's not just the elderly, it's not just um, the disadvantaged, it's fit young people, it's pregnant women and babies, um, and of course the homeless and disadvantaged, but we're all vulnerable. And all our pets are vulnerable, our livestock's vulnerable, our crops uh, are in the same boat. 
many people in places are still suffering from the effects of the bushfires of 2019 and Black Summer, even after the subsequent floods and the arrival of the pandemic and the further subsequent floods. So those dangerous bushfires we'd never seen their like before and bushfire smoke shrouded capital cities and regional areas, exposing huge numbers of the population to unprecedented levels of toxic air. We don't yet know the long-term impacts of that exposure over that summer. While 43 people died in the fire, researchers report that more than 400 deaths and 3,000 hospitalizations from bushfire smoke alone, um, and they expect other long-term impacts in the years to come. And of course, extreme weather comes in many forms, not just heat and fires and longer drier droughts. There are also the torrential drought downpours and floods, cyclones, hurricanes, damaging storm surges on top of sea level rise, directly and indirectly impacting our um, health and well-being and having ongoing um, impacts, as we know from our experiences. So what about those indirect impacts? Uh, indirect impacts are those that result from how the climate changes our environment and ecosystems, which then harms our health. For example, um, altering patterns of infectious diseases. The ranges for mosquitoes um, and other disease carrying insects are spreading both within Australia and around the world. And rising temperatures and fast maturing disease vectors are helping spread dangerous tropical diseases like Zika and Ross River virus and <coughs> dengue. Other indirect impacts on our health will be through threats to our clean air, our safe water, our food security. Our food systems are very vulnerable to climate change with lower agricultural yields. Um, more crop and stock losses and less water availability and better conditions for microorganisms to grow, so bacteria and algae. And they'll likely cause more problems like those we saw with the massive fish kills, with the drying up of the uh, rivers and the running out of water in various towns and villages. And there are billions of people, of course, who depend on the snow melt from the Himalayas, so not only in Australia via the Indus and other major world rivers whose um, that snow melt is decreasing. More heat also makes air pollution more toxic. A lot of it's from burning fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. Um, so that's making allergies and asthma get worse. And air pollution is a major killer of children across the world. The recent IPCC report also notes that um, climate hazards are a growing driver of involuntary migration and displacement. I think I mentioned that before. People have mentioned mental health and mental health impacts are huge and growing and a much stronger focus in this latest IPCC report as well. So there's a whole new language that's emerged, uh, solastalgia and ecological grief and eco-anxiety and new words that have been coined and new fields of psychology reflecting the connections between the growing damage that we're seeing in our world and growing levels of emotional suffering. And the need for action is urgent as is so eloquently um, illustrated by the student strikers sign. The latest IPCC report says that there's new evidence of detrimental impacts of climate change on mental health. Uh, it's expected to further threaten mental health and children and adolescents, particularly girls and elderly people and Indigenous people and people with existing mental, physical and medical challenges are particularly vulnerable. And those mental health challenges uh, are going to arise from exposure to higher temperatures, extreme weather events, displacement, malnutrition, conflict. You get a bit, it's terrible to keep repeating that litany. However, we need to face um, the facts. Today's children face an uncertain future, despite dramatic improvements in survival and nutrition and education over recent decades. Um, climate change is undoing that, that development that we've seen. 
So present and future generations of children are bearing and will bear, will continue to bear an unacceptably high disease burden from climate change. So perhaps we should look at what we should be doing. And there are pathways forward. The IPCC report says that we need key transformations to facilitate that climate resilient development pathways. And those transformational changes need to be responsive to regional, local and indigenous knowledge. And it was really good to hear that, um, that reflected in the last presentation. Sorry. Um, and the Climate and Health Alliance agrees with that perspective. In 2021, it revitalized its framework for a national strategy for climate health and well-being. And it's been advocating very strongly for climate and health to be at the center of the government's um, post-COVID policies and plans. So if we proceed with our eyes open to the interconnected and complex challenges, that we face with courage, humility, and the generosity that characterize the community response to COVID-19, we can employ solutions that offer wide ranging benefits and set us, up to, uh, set us up to succeed and flourish into the future, a future that we choose, not easy. So how climate ready is the Australian health system? Um, Last year, the Royal Australasian College of Physicians uh, looked at climate change in Australia's healthcare systems. They reviewed the literature, uh, policy and practice and produced a series of case studies which illustrate the real life impact of climate change on the health of Australians and the system. Basically, they found, no, we're not ready. Um, we need much greater preparedness among communities and within the health system for future climate fuel disasters. And that also demonstrated the need for urgent action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to avoid locking in further disastrous climate change. So that has huge implications for all, all of our policy across society. But just to give you a brief taste of um, some of the key findings from the case studies, these were describing existing and recent impacts of climate change on health and the health system. In the Torres Strait, um, and I'll just give you a few little snippets, sea level rise, coastal inundation, um, climate change is harming country. It's washing their ancestral graves out to sea. Um, it's harming community, it's harming um, systems and identity and health. Um, indigenous health and remote Indigenous communities um, is exacerbated by climate change. So that disadvantage from conditions like high heat and humidity, poor housing stock, insecure water, electricity, coastal erosion. Um, in particular, uh, what was seen is that high levels of um, climate sensitive infectious diseases uh, sorry, climate sensitive diseases like TB, dengue, Ross River, and soil borne diseases like meliodosis um, are very highly prevalent in those remote communities. So about 5% of the disease burden is in, oh no, sorry, about 20% of the disease burden in about 5% of the population. Um, in Queensland, uh, in Stanthorpe, um, a real example of the compounding and cascading impacts. So amidst the drought and fears of a day zero event, they're about to run out of water, the bushfires struck in um, 2019 before the, the pandemic hit and um, mental health has been significantly affected with particular, with all these cascading and frequent events, there's no time or capacity to prepare for future climate related impacts. But looking at cities, if you look at Western Sydney, uh, extreme heat and widening health inequality um, are leading to potentially unlivable suburbs. So Western Sydney actually provides a bit of a window, the experts are saying, into the future for other Australian cities, 
without assertive transformational mitigation and adaptation strategies at local and national levels. In Canberra, uh, due to bushfire smoke, equipment failed and the air filtration in the hospital was unable to deal with the unprecedented levels of smoke. So babies were being born into smoke-filled delivery suites. Um, so really we need to use not only the history and what and projecting into future, we need to start using our imagination a lot better to imagine the scenarios that we'll be facing. Okay. This is just from the um, Queensland Climate Risk, Queensland Health Climate Risk Strategy, and just shows a timeline of um, uh, extreme weather events over the two years to 2020. So um, they included record flood levels in Townsville, uh, droughts with more than two thirds of Queensland officially drought declared in December 2019 and reduced air quality affecting large parts of the state uh, due to dust storms as well as bushfires, not to mention seven tropical cyclones. And we've heard recent, more recently of the further ones, further impacts. So not surprisingly, in Queensland, um, the increased intensity and frequency of extreme weather events like prolonged heat waves, floods and bushfires directly impact our health, particularly in remote and regional communities and many First Nations communities. And uh, these conditions trigger poor air quality, outbreaks of infectious disease, risks of flood safety and drinking water quality and have effects on our mental health. And they can lead to extreme pressure on the public health system. How am I going for time? Would someone wave at me when I've got five minutes to go? Okay, so the impact on health services. In Queensland, smoke from the 2019-20 bushfire season is estimated to have caused about 47 extra deaths, additional deaths, 135 cardiovascular admissions, heart, heart conditions, um, 245 respiratory admissions and 113 emergency admissions for asthma. And that, uh, that's expected to increase, um, it, that physical and mental trauma is expected to increase over time. And the integrity and reliability of our public health system is at risk because they were designed and built uh, before we were taking account of those sorts of risks. Including the disruption of failure or failure of service infrastructure like um, uh, electricity, telecommunications, transport and water supplies and sewerage supplies. So without foresight and adaptation, the predicted changes in climate can result in unpredictable uh, service disruption, costly repairs, uh, and even replacement of essential health services and infrastructure. And if you look at where a lot of our, or some of our hospitals, some of our biggest hospitals are built on floodplains. But it also goes the other way. So Queensland Health has an impact on climate change. It's an enormous um, uh, user of resources and producer of waste and emissions. Hospitals, as well as the pharmaceutical industry, are very intensive um, emissions producers. The Australian health sector alone produces 7% uh, of Australia's health emissions, uh, sorry, greenhouse gas emissions. And if we don't take any action, this trajectory is rising and will contribute to irreversible changes in our climate. Queensland Health is responsible for over 45% of the total government emissions, Queensland government emissions. A lot of that's from electricity and it, that electricity costs the department approximately $100 million a year. Um, pharmaceuticals are the second largest contributor and we have numerous opportunities for positive change. Uh, the Office for Hospital Sustainability was set up as an election commit commitment um, in 2020. Um, it has a $30 million emission reduction plan, and that's being used 
uh, largely for electricity, um, solarizing hospital buildings and uh, energy efficiency and uh, swapping out lead lighting and a whole range of, of things. But they'll also set benchmarks and targets and uh, make sure that investment is going into green and sustainable infrastructure. And they'll be reviewing waste and increasing the use of environmentally sustainable products. About 60% of the, the health system's emissions come from the supply chain, from the things that we buy to produce the care, provide the care that we deliver. So they're also expected to deliver system-wide cost savings and improve environmental uh, performance outcomes. So Queensland Health actually has quite uh, some good policy responses. Um, the Human Health and Wellbeing Climate Change Adaptation Plan was uh, launched, was, was brought out in 2018. Um, following that, the Health Department developed climate change adaptation planning guidelines for hospitals and health services, and that's been rolled out across the state. But of course, we've been dealing with a pandemic and it hasn't been top of the priority list. So that's a very slow process of, of doing that risk assessment at each individual hospital and health service. Um, the department has also released a climate risk strategy, which is a comprehensive strategy covering mitigation and adaptation um, fairly recently. And uh, the department is committed to meeting the government's emission reduction targets. So beginning to wrap up now, um, I'm borrowing a slide here in my conclusion from Dr. Professor Taryn Wee-Ramantri, Wee who is a very respected public health figure. He's been a, a chief health officer of two jurisdictions, and he led the, um, uh, the inquiry into um, health impacts of climate change in Western Australia just recently. And he was speaking at a Greening the Healthcare Forum um, uh, a month ago. And he was saying, okay, you know, it doesn't look good. Uh, the trajectory that we're going towards is certainly very grim. Um, and that immediate impacts are being felt many years earlier than expected. The, the community is, is, has got a much better idea of the fact that climate change is a health issue, not just an environmental issue. Um, it affects everything. It affects our whole lives. So um, there are strong green shoots of activity within the health sector in mitigation as well as adaptation. And there are growing networks of health professionals very, very active in the field but there are many gaps and inconsistency and the desire to change course, and go further and faster is still being frustrated by um, commercial power and interests, which are pretty much unchallenged, according to him. That report from the Royal um, Australasian College of Physicians um, came up with a number of recommendations, including that we need a coordinated national strategy on climate change and health. Um, the health sector needs to get its act in, in order and it needs to become net zero or aim to be net zero by 2040. Climate change vulnerability and adaptis, ad, sorry, climate change vulnerability and capacity assessment assessments with a focus on locally led planning need to be carried out everywhere. We need a dedicated climate health resilience research fund to support innovation and evidence-based action. And we need to develop the, health, the climate health capacity of the health workforce and the sector, um, as well as the community. So we need to embed indigenous Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander knowledge and leadership in all climate health policy and action and invest in prevention and early intervention. And this is a sort of big shift coming from the, the, the large medical colleges to say, okay, it's not all about the curative end. We really need to keep people out of hospital. We need the prevention to keep people healthy. So um, I conclude with a, a, a promising development. Um, in the budget summary on Tuesday, 
uh, the government has announced 4.4 million for climate and health. Um, and that, that is to provide 3.4 million over four years uh, from this year onwards and 7.7 .7 million ongoing to develop a national health and climate change strategy. So that strategy that all the health sector has been calling for is now going to be um, funded and led and also to establish a national health sustainability and climate unit, um, which will address emerging health risks coming from climate change and also coordinate across the country climate change responses across the, the health system. So I might finish on that slightly more positive note. Thank you, Sue. So a few questions from the floor, one over there, thank you. Hi, just wanted to ask with uh, most of the diseases that are being carried by mosquitoes being categorized as neglected tropical diseases, of which there's no TGA approved vaccine or treatment for. I wanted to really understand like, what is the Queensland government or even the federal government doing to sort of drive innovation and R&D in this space to try and develop vaccines or cures? I'm sure there's a, a lot of work happening in that space and I'm sorry, I can't provide the answers. I haven't got that sort of detailed insight. Sorry about that. And I missed a bit of your question. Were you talking about particular diseases like Zika or I thought I heard? Um, it's the microphone on. Um, I guess the whole, well, most of them which are carried by the mosquitoes are neglected tropical diseases. So yes, a lot yes. of them don't have cures or vaccines. Mm. And we're already seeing dengue cases popping up in far north Queensland and the Torres Strait Island. Yep. And I think dengue is particularly hard to develop a vaccine for. So I was sort of interested, is there a funding put aside for even in the Queensland state budget or the federal budget to sort I'm not of start sure. developing these? I'm not sure. And as you would project budgets in health as well as across all the sectors are increasingly feeling the effects of all these cascading and compounding disasters as well as new diseases, pandemics sweeping through. So um, I think it's a, it's a really difficult situation. Sorry, I can't be any more specific. What do you think the um, Queensland Health um, Climate Plan would be, they would be looking to They'd certainly address be looking, those things? Yes, and there are experts who could tell you a lot more than I can about that. Um, I can actually give a um, personal experience with the mosquito diseases. So um, this year, after having long COVID, I got Japanese encephalitis virus. Yeah, so I was working in the agricultural sector in rural Queensland. Um, yeah, it was very um, difficult experience as I had um, moderate symptoms, but I did make a full recovery, but I was alone in overcoming that. There was no support from um, the health system. Yeah. Mm. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about the Climate and Health Alliance because I find it um, really interesting what you were talking about and if you could just provide some more insight into um, yeah. what the Climate yeah. and Health Alliance does, please. Sure. So the Climate and Health Alliance has been around since about 2010, I think, 2012 maybe, and it was set up by Fiona Armstrong initially. It's a very small, uh, very lean very capable organization um, that coordinates um, or is seen as the, the peak body for the Royal College of Physicians is a member of the Climate and Health Alliance, the nurses organizations, the, nurse, the nurses and midwives organizations, all the different allied health professions are members of some of those 80 organizational members. Individuals can actually join as Friends of CAHA, Climate and Health Alliance. And you just go to the website 
anyone can go to the website. They have fantastic newsletters that come out regularly. You can subscribe to those. You can hear about all the new developments in climate and health from around the world. They also have a sustainable healthcare newsletter. They coordinate in Australia the um, Global Green and Healthy Hospitals Network. That's their sustainable healthcare program. Global Green and Healthy Hospitals is a sort of um, it's it's a program of healthcare without harm, which is a global um, organisation fighting to uh, reduce the toxic impact of the health system and improve population health. So, yeah, it's a great organization. Look it up, join up. Do you have questions from the floor? Do we have anything else? Hi. Um, you mentioned that the RECP put the X amount of recommendations last year. Who were they addressed to, the recommendations? Um, the report came out just before COP27, oh, 26 in, in Glasgow, and um, it was very strongly addressed to the federal government, but also to other, to the population, to, to people, uh, to the health professions. Um, so if it was addressed to the government, had the government responded? Well, they have uh, just funded this... Um, point, point 0.7%. Oh, no, no. Well, 4.4 million over. Over four years. Yeah, it's not, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. Year. I agree with you. Yeah. Because that was their response to the recommendation for our I suppose RACP. it wasn't. It, it was a report. You know, people put out reports, the Grattan Institute, the Australia Institute, the RACP. What they... I was involved in, in putting together that report as well. And what they found was... This is possibly not quite to your point, but 10 separate colleges, other colleges signed up to that. So the, the College of Physicians is the sort of overarching group. So the surgeons, the um, emergency physicians, the oncologists, the pedi pediatricians, the ophthalmologists all came together very collaboratively to support the development and um, production of that. They've been campaigning very strongly ever since. Um, so there's a big campaign to advocate for those, not only those recommendations, but all the stuff that comes comes out of, the, of all that action. Okay. Not sure if that helps. Well, one would expect them someone, whoever the report was directed at, was to come back with, uh, usually when there was a report of recommendation from a fairly senior body, the government comes back with a response, well, a they are, verbal, verbal yeah. written response to that. Yeah. We would accept seven or six uh -huh. or three of those, and the rest... Those are, are usually good. commissioned by the government, and if they commission it, sure, they yeah. will have to respond to it, but I think... Anybody can put out a report, sadly, and nobody has to pay any attention. But, okay, right. But um, they are part of the discussions. So the new government has very quickly, they had committed to implementing a national climate health and wellbeing plan before they came to government. They committed in 2017 when the original framework was put to them and launched in Parliament House. Um, by the coalition and Labor and the Greens jointly. Um, so that was, there's been a framework around for a while and it's been advocated for a long time, but it wasn't, it was welcomed, but it was not funded or implemented. So this government has at least, you know, within a very short period of time said, okay, we committed several years ago, we're now going to do it. What do you want us to do? So they're talking with those key organisations, they're talking with the Climate and Health Alliance and the College of Physicians now about how to go about implementing the actions that we need to take. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks, Sue, for the very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I took a picture of one of your slides. It just knocked me down, um, and it said that economic analysis showed that better air quality alone would lead to enough health benefits and saved health costs to offset, easily offset the global costs 
of emissions reduction. Um, I wish I'd known about that every time I've been to, you know, lobbying or advocating right. for emissions reduction. We should be shouting that from the rooftops. It's, it, you know, the health is our biggest cost, definitely to the government. It's, a, it's our biggest cost. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, here we've got very clear lines, and I'm always trying to show those lines that if you invest now, it's actually going to save you money in the long time. Uh, the cost-benefit analysis of, of action uh, always comes out on top, and but with health, I mean that's a real clear winner. I wish we were shouting that all the time. Great, and health would really like to be there supporting the other sectors in in advocating and getting action. Thank you. I think we will draw it to a close shortly, um, and I want to thank Sue again for this morning. Thank you so much. That's a very interesting aspect. I guess, um, you know, um, the health aspect of climate change is something that, um, unlike the professionals in fire, in uh, flood response, um, and science-based um, looking at climate change facts and so on, unlike that, health affects us all, of course. And I think some of those facts that Sue presented about the hospital um, emissions and so on. Quite, um, I, I was not aware of that, and I'm sure most, a lot of us weren't. So that's um, something to be uh, taking forward. Certainly, that whole overarching effect of of the uh, climate change on our health systems. But just to um, conclude this morning, I think um, you know it is fairly dire. Obviously, the situation from our three speakers this morning, and. Um, while we don't, uh, you know, we, we certainly um, feel depressed about it, but I think all three speakers have also given us some um, indication of what is being done in their spaces. So certainly the, the science um, side of things, clearly monitoring very closely what's happening. And there are lots of, there's a lot of information around as Helen presented. Uh, as to um, you know what the facts really are, we do, we're not in the business of um, you know no facts or what, what's it uh, <laughs> um, uh, fake news or something. It's it's science based that we need to look at. Um, Lee presented the the bushfire um, situation, and again, or even though it's dire, um, he also indicated where there've been major breakthroughs and positive developments in terms of coordination and modeling and so on going forward. It's certainly a big challenge still when we do have a bushfire season, but um, nevertheless, there are some positive uh, moves happening. With the flood one that Ella presented, again, uh, uh, you know, major problems, again, as she presented and going forward, the scenario is not looking good even for the Brisbane River, which we're all familiar with. Um, but the QRA certainly um, is uh, looking at doing a lot there in terms of preparation and uh, increasing uh, the way we, we do tend to adapt. And of course, uh, Sue's presentation just now, what's happening in the health system and quite um, you know, uh, impressive really what Queensland Health has been doing over the last couple of years to try to Im improve our hospital uh, preparation and so on for climate change. So I would like again to thank all three speakers, four speakers, sorry, this morning Ella's not with us now, of course, but um, thank you again for your presentations, really excellent and uh, very, very informative. Thank you again. Would, would you like to thank our speakers again? So lunch will be from one to two in the same place. If I could ask you to come back at two. Board now for our final speaker of the day. And then we will have the panel uh, session with, uh, I, I imagine, lots more questions from you. So could I now introduce Scott Buchanan for our final um, presentation? Scott is Executive Director of the Wet Tropics Management Authority based in Cairns. We're very pleased you could come down to be with us, Scott, so thank you. 
And he has 27 years experience in the public service as well as what he is doing now. But you have his bio again with you, if you wish to read that. Now, again, as I said, just before lunch, I think, you know, we're certainly hearing about all the things we need to be worried about climate change. But each speaker has endeavoured to give a little bit of um, information and hope as to where the adaptation is going. So certainly, I think um, Scott's brief is to talk about policy, but he will also give some examples from the wet tropics. And I think uh, then we'll take up a, once again our question, is Queensland prepared for warming climate with the panel especially? So over to you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Rafi. Uh, can everybody hear me? Great. Um, Yes, uh, well, I'd like to also acknowledge um, the Royal Geographical Society of Queensland and um, UQ for holding this event. Uh, I think it's a really important discussion and um, yeah, I thank them for organising this on, on today. Um, so yeah, uh, Raphne gave an introduction. Scott Buchanan, I'm from uh, Cairns um, and I'm down here for the weekend for this uh, presentation. I won't talk too much about who I am. It's in the bio. Um, On. It is on. Other side. Yeah, so to start off, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the, the uh, traditional owners of the country in which we're meeting, um, the Turrbal and Jagra people. Uh, and because the country that I'm lucky enough to work on is the wet tropics, uh, I also want to acknowledge the rainforest Aboriginal people as the uh, traditional custodians and the stewards of that land over thousands of generations. Okay, let's start the work. So the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area, this is a, a map here, and you can see it's about 900,000 hectares. Um, it extends from just south of Cooktown down to directly west of uh, the Strand in Townsville. Um, there's, um, uh, we have uh, 20 uh, tribal groups living within the area. So it, it's, a, it's a cultural landscape, 20 tribal groups living within the area, eight language groups, and about 20,000 people still directly connected to country in the area. Um, you, you've got a, a saying there from David Attenborough, it's an amazing place. Um, it's uh, you know, one of the world's most biodiverse areas. Um, and um, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll talk more about its qualities as we go. Um, so this presentation, I just wanted to give you a bit of a rundown of um, uh, climate change impacts on particularly the biodiversity and the ecology of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. Um, then talk a bit about why is that important? So it's a World Heritage Area, why is those impacts important? Um, I'm then going to talk about policy responses very quickly on the international. Um, and then Queensland policy responses. And then I'll get down to the nitty gritty of the, the wet tropics and what we're doing in terms of responses to the issues we're dealing with. So this is the climate change impact. So we've seen a lot of this data already, but this is wet tropics specific. I think this is the thing. I think the really interesting thing is that higher temperatures and you know, we talk about that average, but it's really those heat wave conditions, those extreme temperatures that, that really have a big difference. The uncertain changes to fire frequency, I was just saying that over at lunch, uh, we had 300 hectares of rainforest burn out in 2018. It's never burnt in, in the history of European settlement. Uh, and this really interesting fact here, cloud stripping. So, up to 30% of, of the stream water flow in the wet tropics is from those mount, high mountain areas, trees actually extracting water from clouds and using that water. And then that becomes part of the stream flow. As we get a, a warming temperature, what we're gonna see is clouds rising higher above those trees. Um, so you can imagine if there was any area that lost 30% of their stream flow, what that would do to the hydrology of the area. It's a significant concern. 
This, this graph shows what's happening to birds. And this is from you know, 15 to 20 years of, uh, of uh, monitoring data. And you can see that different birds will have different um, uh, reactions. So what we're seeing is you know, up the top here, tooth-filled bowerbirds are going back in numbers. Oops. And then you, know, you get to the fairy domains and they're actually increasing in numbers. So you're seeing a difference between the specialists and the generalist. So the more specialist the birds are, um, the more they're, they're suffering as a result of the changing climate. What we're, find, what we're seeing, particularly in the wet tropics, is impact on what we're calling montane species. So species you know, up in the altitude areas, you know, between the, the 600 to 800 metres, and we're seeing them start to move up those mountains as it gets warmer, uh, particularly with possums, we're seeing that, and definitely with bowerbirds. And what's going to happen is they're going to run out of mountains. So that's, that's the big fear that we have. This is another demonstration, and they're very similar to the sort of maps we saw today, you know, talking about climate change. We're now seeing what does this mean for species richness? So this is vertebrates. And so this is the current climate down on the left-hand side. Um, so the red, the high, the darker the red, the more species richness you have in those areas. And you can see as it gets warmer and warmer, we're losing that species diversity. That's a really frightening. And I remember I showed this um, to some rainforest Aboriginal people, Phil Rist, uh, who's the CEO of Girigan Aboriginal Corporation. When he saw this, he said that was the first time it really hit him because he could see his totemic species, get, you know, losing totemic species. And this again is just demonstrating, we've talked about the, um, the, the CCP targets. So on the left, the medium emission control, so RCP uh, 4.5. So that's what happens if we um, commit, you know, meet the Paris, targets that's the sort of change that we'll see so we will see more extinctions we'll see more endangered uh, but if we go on to the business as usual which is the rcp 8.5 model um, you see the, the the change is is staggering and it's you know you start to see changes um, 30 years before what you're seeing so this is what it is all about if we keep the business as usual um, this is what you're going to see with species in the wet tropics world heritage area. So climate change is the most significant threat to biodiversity and it's the most significant threat to um, the Australian wet tropics world heritage area. Uh, I, I put this comic up because it, it reminds me of um, one of our directors, uh, Pref Professor Steve Williams, who's been working in the wet tropics doing mountaintop species monitoring for, for over 30 years. And um, yeah, so he's just checking, is anybody listening? Because he's been saying this and there's been reports. You know, we've had reports in 2010, 2015, 2018, and then 2019, well, you know, why keep producing the reports? And the, the scary thing is that the 2010 reports was looking at the modeling and saying, this is what we're gonna see with these sort of temperature increases. And they've been very, very accurate in terms of species loss and temperature increase. So why is this important? The Wet Tropics World Heritage Area is a biodiversity wet spot. It's the second most irreplaceable World Heritage Area in the world. And World Heritage is, means that it's a place that's so significant that it's of world, um, it, it's, a, it's a world um, possession, I suppose because it is so unique. Of everything that is special in the world, world heritage is the top of those things. So Queens, Queensland's wet tropics, you, know, you can see all those, beat, um, those statistics down there, uh, how high the biodiversity area is. This is an area that's less than 2% of Australia's landmass. And we've got 60% of Australia's butterflies, 65% of our fern species, so on and so forth. In the Wet Tropics World Heritage uh, nomination, we're listed for all four natural criteria. Um, and that's because of the, the, the high biodiversity and the record of evolutionary um, uh, 
yeah, eco ecological evolution that happens. And of course, um, superlative beauty. So I won't go too much onto the wet tropics, but just to know that this is a really special place. And so when you see those previous slides and what we're potentially losing, it's very, very scary. So today we've sort of seen it from the human dimension. Now this is, now I'm talking about, you know, animal species dimension. It would be lovely if after all today, we thought all the animals had to do was wait in the forest until we all died out because of what we're going to do. We're going to burn ourselves and we're going to pollute ourselves. But no, we're actually hurting them as well. So I'll start talking about some policy, policy responses because that's what I've been asked to do. And I, I'm only going to touch on, on the um, international policy uh, response. Paris, um, you know, Paris 2015, COP, COP 16, is a good example of um, you know, an international response to climate change. In the World Heritage space, there's been a number of reports that, that have come out. And I think also at lunchtime, we talked about this, that you know, in the IPCC um, for World Heritage, Natural World Heritage Areas, it's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. They're all massive bureaucracies. So we've been talking about climate change in World Heritage for, for a decade or more, and yet here we are in Venice and uh, the tide is already in. Um, so we're still talking about it and they're still talking about it in the international phase. There's been a, a, um, um, a, a um, climate policy for World Heritage that's been in the draft stage for four years. So it's still trying to get through um, that bureaucracy. So it's a slow moving beast, our response to climate change, and it needs to move quicker. Um, there was a report released, uh, released this week, the United Nations uh, Environmental Report, 27th of October, so two days, three days ago. Um, and it said that, you know, in terms of Paris, the Paris commitments, um, the gap between what people, have, what countries are committed to and the actions that countries are doing is massive. So we're not even on that lower projection or even the medium projection. We're still at business as usual. So that's, that's where we are. So the international is a quite a sad, sad story. Um, I'll let, now talk a bit about Queensland's response. And I'm talking about Queensland because um, in the past decade or so, the states have been leading the response to climate change. Um, the, the federal government has been missing in action. So Queensland are doing quite a lot and they do have a, a climate ac action plan which has set some targets. And, um, and, and some good targets as well. Um, but, you know, uh, as a number of reports have suggested, that if we really want to meet our COP26 targets, then, you know, uh, we shouldn't be continuing to um, have new uh, gas and oil uh, uh, structures put in place or, or mining, but it's still happening. So we're trying our best, but there's still some anomalies in the way that Queensland is operating as well. Um, the Queensland Energy and Jobs Plan came out last week. And again, you know, there's some really significant uh, movements that are happening there. 70% renewable by 2032, uh, pushing that up to 80% renewables by 2035. Uh, lowering out emissions, Queensland super grid. So that's how do you uh, remove that reliance on the fossil fuels and start building the, the grids to where that renewable energy is going to be. And there's a number of key actions around there. I think one of the heartening things I saw come out of the energy and jobs plan was that commitment to engage with com uh, community. And I think that's really important. Um, that's a re that was a really important part because one of the things that we are seeing with renewables is um, they are large land, yeah, large um, infrastructure, large industrial infrastructure um, that will have an impact on biodiversity. And the challenge uh, in policy uh, and for people who are worried about climate change is how do you respond to climate change while at the same time not making the biodiversity crisis worse? So there's, there's going to be continuing to be challenges that we need to, to respond to. There's other initiatives, of course. Um, the 2032 Olympics is, is um, going to be, they, they're hoping 
they're aiming for a climate positive Olympic and Paralympic game. Um, there's been a lot of work, and this is really, uh, I suppose this is in the adaptation work. So we saw the, 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 the Queensland Health Adaptation Plan in about 2000. 18, 19, Queensland released a number of climate adaptations plans. So they, they released a, a World Heritage Adaptation Plan, and then they worked with industries like health, uh, but also like tourism, um, I'm trying to think of others, um, transport, to develop their own climate adaptation plan. So Queensland has been sort of moving very far ahead with climate adaptation plans. And up here, this land restoration fund, so we're, we're all aware of carbon markets, so that's, you know, how do you get carbon credits by planting trees or not removing trees. Um, Queensland's been doing a lot of space in looking at uh, what are the other co-benefits and how do you make those co-benefits pay? So what that means is, you know, can people get um, uh, a capital return from uh, biodiversity and, and improving biodiversity position? Um, it, it's been talked a bit, bit, it's been talked about a lot, on the world stage. And in fact, it's been talked about so much that I, and I've been doing a lot of reading that I thought, wow, Australia is so be, far behind everybody. But then when you actually talk to other people in other countries, Australia is actually a, a far way ahead in terms of this um, natural capital market. And it's very, very embryonic, embryonic in Australia as well. So it's at its very early stages, but it's really important. It's about how do you invest in improving the environment and biodiversity outcomes. So I'll come down, I'll drill down now to uh, the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area and the Wet Tropics Management Authority and what we're doing in terms of that policy space and, and how we're responding to, you know, some of the big threats we talked about. So in 2019, our board released a 10-point plan and the board is an a independent board, but we are funded by government and my board do respond to two ministers. They respond to the Minister for Environment at the federal level and at the state level. I acknowledge Sally Drimmel, who's here today, who's one of our board directors. Um, but yeah, during that time, during the 2019 election, so it was seen as a, as a very um, controversial move for a board to come out with a very strong statement about the impacts of climate on the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. Uh, but they did that because, you know, they were aware um, of the risks that were happening uh, to the Wet Tropics World Area. So, so they come out with a 10-point plan. And you can see the first nine are really about adaptation to a certain degree. And number 10 is that mitigation, you know, which is about reducing emissions. Uh, so number 10 is probably where the board have the least influence. Um, but they can be advocates for that sort of work. But obviously the 10 point plan set out a process of moving forward and tried to offer suggestions of how we as a community uh, can respond to climate, the threats of climate. And I'll just talk to a couple. Under, under law, we're required to produce a state of the wet tropics report. And if you produce a state of environment report every year, you, will, you don't see much change because not a lot changes in, in 12 months. So a number of years ago, we decided to, you know, move that out, that actual state of the wet tropics report to maybe five, six years. And then every year, bring out a theme that would, you know, highlight the state of the wet tropics, but through a different process rather than a, you know, precious, precious stress response type of report. So in the past three years, we've looked at, setting policy direction through the state of wet tropics reporting. So these reports are tabled in parliament, both, both houses of parliament. And so we use these to again advocate. Um, and, you know, getting back to the question that was asked about the responses, we don't always get a response to our reports either. But it also helps us work with the community. So in 2019, we talked about creating our climate future. That was about providing information to the community about things that they can do or things that we can help them do. Last year, we talked about landscape restoration, and I'll talk to that very shortly. And this year, we've just re released one, which is the restoration economy. So it's starting to talk about natural capital and how community can utilise natural capital, how landholders, landowners can utilise natural capital to improve biodiversity outcomes on their property. So 
acting locally, thinking globally. We've also released a number of initiatives, um, except ACT ADAPT. So that was our climate adaptation plan. So it was saying to people, you've got to accept that this is an issue and then you need to act and we need to adapt to climate. And again, that was a call to the community and it was a call, not only a call to the community, it was also a call to us that we need to be better engaging the community and working closely with the community. When I talk about the community, I'm, I'm obviously mean rainforest Aboriginal peoples in that group as well. Traditional custodians are really important for adaptation. Traditional custodians up in, up in Gimboy country, which is Cairns, the Gimboy Wallaburra Yadidji, it's still in their storylines when they used to walk out to the edge of, you know, to, to where, where is now the Great Barrier Reef, that used to be their country. So they've adapted to significant change to their, to their landscape. And so we need to learn from that. How long ago was that? 10,000 10, 10, years ago, yeah. Um, so, and, and in 2020, when we had the, uh, the, the pandemic hit everybody, uh, we worked very closely with Terrain NRM, which is the natural resource management group up in, up, up in the wet tropics and uh, CAFNEC, which is the um, environment uh, group up there, to deliver the, the green and blue economic stimulus package. The idea being that we thought with everybody unemployed, particularly up in Cairns, which is you know, based on a tourism economy, uh, there would be stimulus. And we thought if you're gonna stimulate this economy, you need to stimulate it uh, in the natural economy because that, that is where you get best return for your buck. You get employment, you get training, and, you'll, and because, you know, what I say about uh, the wet tropics, you know, often when you talk to politicians, it's either, you know, it's the economy or the environment. You can't have them both. Well, actually, in the wet tropics, the economy is the environment. And that's a, that's a really key message. And this document really drove that, docu that, that message home. Um, Queensland engaged, uh, then initiated a reef assist program um, which is only a couple of years. We would have liked it to have been longer. But out of that, with you know, $2.6 million, we were able to employ uh, over 30 long-term unemployed uh, rainforest Aboriginal kids. Um, you know, you, you can't put $2.6 million in a road and employ that many people. You'd probably employ three. So the difference between the natural economy and every other investment is phenomenal in terms of employment outcomes. And obviously, you know, we're now taking advantage of the 20, 2021, 2030 United Nations decade on ecosystem restoration. So why am I talking about that sort of stuff? Well, when you look at the, the wet tropics world heritage area, and this is actually the wet tropics bio, bio region, so it's larger than the uh, world heritage area. Many of those really important endemic plants and endemic animals actually don't know about those boundaries between the the World Heritage Area and outside the World Heritage Area. Um, so to them, as long as it has the climatic and habitat, then that's where they're going to reside. So you can see this dark line, that's the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. A lot of that space out here in particular is, uh, is cleared farmland. Um, but if we were to rehabilitate a percentage of that, that recreates that high montane uh, habitat that those species drastically need. So as part of our restoration policy, it's about increasing the amount of rehabilitation that happens yeah, in, this, in this area and other corridors, other important corridors. So it's about developing up and building the refugia potentiality in the area so that you know when it gets hot, when the species are starting to move up, that there's corridors to get them to other eye spots and there's habitat that will um, protect their, their life cycle. So we're working, we've developed, um, what has happened previously is we have a fantastic community up there. Um, a lot of people uh, who get out and plant trees every weekend. Uh, come rain, hail, shine. They actually like it better when it's raining because up there it's not cold when it rains and it's not hot. So, and you know the trees are going to survive. So they'll do a lot of planning. 
but it's all voluntary work and they've been doing that for 30 years and in 30 years they've planted 300 hectares so it's a great result but it's not enough you know we, we need you know 30,000 hectares or at least 3,000 hectares but you know we need we need significant amounts to go in so what we've done through those previous documents, which are starting to lay the framework and starting to tell the story about why restoration is important and why it's important that people invest in restoration is we're starting to work with our community to develop a restoration alliance. So it's about bringing everybody in, the people who are doing it, but also bringing the landholders in so they're more open to the idea. All farmers are very reluctant to put trees on their property because of the, you know, the, the, the risks that they see. But it's about educating them, putting them in, in touch with the practitioners, a lot of them who are ex-farmers. Um, but the really important party that we're bringing in is investors. So we know people want to invest in this area, but they want to invest in, in big areas. Right? So they're not interested in 10 hectares at a time. They're interested in, in significant areas. And so you know, we're working with landholders to identify sub-catchment plans amongst those groups so they've got a product that they can then take to investors and say you know you invest in this this is what we can plan and this is how we're going to increase biodiversity as well as get carbon credits uh, through this restoration activity and then you know this is just to finish on the day i know it's been a really uh struggling day and that we've told a lot of bad stories but um you know this is uh, a lot of the response you get you know what if it's a hoax and we've gone and done all this fantastic work for nothing thank you Got. that's a really good uh, window into the north which many of us don't always get to it's a wonderful area of Queensland isn't it mm. um I just before I forget I'd like to thank all our speakers this morning for including very up-to-date information on their slides as well as the historical background or the context they've all brought us really up to date with what is happening in their respective fields so thank you for for doing that everybody okay questions anyone questions for scott please scott lovely thank you for that a couple of queries and comments. I congratulate you used the word fire frequency, a term that's not fully understood or appreciated in all our conversations about fire, which emerging more. You also mentioned you've been studying birds for about 25, 30 years. Could I suggest, I'm oh, sorry, well, someone else did. Yeah. Could I suggest some of these changes are so long term? I think we need like hundreds of years of observation. So we'll give you examples. Uh, there's birds that appeared in the drought in the wet years of the 50s that reappeared a couple of years ago in the dry years of the, of the 10s. I don't know where they lived in the meantime. They must have had a little refuge somewhere, but I'd never seen them. Echidnas have suddenly become common. Um, as a kid, if you saw a plane turkey, everything stopped, you went out and took photographs of it. About 20 years ago, they were so such a pest, they were sort of shorting out pale lines. They're back to where they were. Um, red kangaroos moved in from the west. That hasn't happened since the last drought, I think, 50 or 100 years ago. Do we understand, I think I've used the word before, do we understand these dynamics of landscape well enough? Are our observations and studies far too short? And a PhD of four years is a complete another waste of time in these long-term trends. Yeah, that's a good question. I suppose you, you have to make decisions on the knowledge that you have it would be fantastic if somebody had been out um, studying these birds you know since um, European um, settlement even before but yeah I think um, you know 20, 20 to 25 years is a pretty good uh, data set to, to base it on and then also you know these these types of monitoring uh, are based on the observed, but also historical records as much as possible. But yeah, you know, 
if, if whenever you can get more data, of course, you're going to have much more accuracy. Uh, one of the things that we've been working with and um, um, it was pretty successful with, with brief assist funding was to put James Cook University working in partnership with Gidmoy, Wallaburra, Yudinji. So it's about bringing that traditional ecological knowledge um, with that Western science. So that Western science approach, but with that traditional ecological knowledge built into it. And uh, so in those cases, and what we're seeing is that um, that data sharing and information sharing is actually generating fantastic results. Uh, I think we're pretty lucky in the wet tropics. Uh, you know, um, uh, the traditional custodians up there haven't been as um, uh, fractured from their, their country as particularly, you know, South Queensland and Southwestern Queensland. So there's still that connection to country, but of course it's not perfect. And there has been, there has been um, fractures uh, as like any, any other community. But that data, that in, there is that information, as I said, that uh, Gimoy Wallaby, Wallaburra Yudinji have the stories that talk about, you know, going out to where the uh, Great Barrier Reef is now. Um, you know, we have a number of, um, we've got the Guga Yulunji, Guga Yulunji, uh, Eastern Guga Yulunji up in um, uh, Daintree area. Um, they have some really strong storylines up there as well. And Eastern Guga Yulunji were, you know, attended, very much living very traditional lifestyles up until the 1920s. So they still have that very strong connection to ancient storylines. Yeah. Well, in, what, in what respect? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And that, that's, um, you know, one of the big things we don't know about is, is uh, burning within uh, rainforest. It, it's never, you know, in terms of um, traditional European land management, um, there hasn't been fire management within uh, rainforest. In fact, when I mentioned that fire that happened at Naleta, which is near Tully, uh, the farmer did what he'd been doing for decades, which is you you burn out some grass and you use the rainforest as your um, fire break because the fire wouldn't keep going traditionally, historically. Uh, this time it did just kept on going. Uh, and this was after significant, it comes back to, it wasn't just the fact that it was a hotter summer, it was a significant heat wave event. Where up at uh, Mount Bartle Frere, the Queensland's highest mountain, at five days of over 36 degrees temperature up the top there. So you know, really extreme weather events. Uh, the farmer lit the fire, expecting the rainforest to act as that buffer, and um, it just went straight up the hill. Three hundred hectares burn out. So, but you know, uh, traditional custodians used to burn within the rainforest. They used to burn to make paths. They used to burn to, you know, remove the weight of wild that that vine that everybody loves when they go walking through the rainforest. So they used to control those things where we, we don't do that anymore. So, you know, um, we're really keen to get rain, traditional custodian, traditional fire practices back into that rainforest country. Mm. Thanks for reminding me about that. So, Could I ask about the cassowaries? What's yeah, sure. the view with, uh, you know, their prospects? Well, actually, their prospects are pretty good. Um, they're, in terms of the population, we're actually finding more and more cassowaries up in up in the Cape. Uh, but in the wet tropics, um, I would suggest that the population is constrained by the habitat. So within that habitat, you know, there's, there is some threat to cassowaries, but in terms of the population, they're probably at their, their, their population max that the habitat allows. So the restoration work would enable more, more cassowaries, but their population, it's pretty stable at about four and a half thousand. Yeah. Can I ask you about the animals? Sure. I just wonder if the traditional stories um, and legends give any description of the animals and if you can use that as a bit of a historical thing of what animals used to be there 
or, and I'd like to know what animals are there. I guess I'm especially thinking about mammals, but you know, there are lizards and reptiles and things. I just wonder if, the, if that relates the, the stories with the animals that are there now or were there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and um, I, I'm not party to, to all those stories, um, but we have heard um, a number of um, traditional custodians talk about the changes that they're seeing with the season and the animals that they would expect to see. So, you know, you'd expect when, when certain trees flower, that's when you should expect to see, um, you know, I'm trying to think of an example, but that's when you probably should expect to see some animals start to move and be ready for their hunting season and all that sort of stuff. And they're seeing that the, the trees are flowering, but they're not seeing those species. So they are seeing that the climate change is starting to move. Um, and and you'll, you hear a lot about that in fishing as well. So in the Great Barrier Reef, they tell those stories, yeah, where they're seeing signs of when there should be abundance and that abundance isn't there. Hmm. Okay, well, I think we might thank Scott there. So thank you again, Scott, for that very interesting presentation. And we'll move now just to our panel. So could I ask the speakers please to come down? We'll move those chairs in the front here. And I will hand over to John Tasker, our RGSQ president. He will moderate the panel for this session. Thank you, John. Yeah. Okay, everyone. So we've heard some fascinating content from our presenters today across a variety of topics. Now's our opportunity with the entire panel of experts here to try and get some holistic views and some questions that hopefully we can get a few different perspectives on from their various domains of interest. So to kick off, do we have anything from the floor? Up the back. Hi, I think, thank you very much. It's been really informative. I think all of you have mentioned engaging with community and, but you didn't articulate how that would be done. And I'm, I'm very interested in that. Oh, I'm, I'm mic'd up as well, so I might start. So, yeah, that's that's a good question. And um, the work that I mentioned at the end there, the Wet Tropics Restoration Alliance, um, is about working with community groups. So we've got a number of really active groups up in up in uh, the Wet Tropics. Um, uh, you know, in terms of uh, land care groups, so you know, the smaller land care groups as well as um, group up in the tableland called treat so it's a tablelands and um, uh, tablelands and uh evident uh table so tablelands anyway the tree their tree plan has been operating for 40 years i think they celebrate their 40th year birthday um so uh the alliance is about working with those smaller groups and bringing them into the fold uh and and working with them on on solutions um, you know, there's a number of other approaches we take as well. So social media is really effective and particularly uh, with videos. Um, I think a, a couple of years ago, um, you know, if you come to our event, uh, it would always be that same sort of um, group that we'd see event after event. Uh, but with social media, particularly videos, it starts to pick up the younger generation. And so we are seeing the demographics of the people that we're talking to change quite a lot. So social media is really important. Um, uh, you know, having events. So there's a couple of really uh, key events up in Cairns, uh, Cairns Eco Fiesta and Townsville also has something very similar. So they're environment uh, uh, related festivals, uh, which are really very uh, strongly supported by the community. So we make sure that we have a presence there and get an opportunity to talk to the community through those events as well. So there's a number, you have to have a number of different tacks because um, 
not a you know you can you can organize an event yourself um but you're not going to get everybody there you need to go out to where people are and where they're meeting I'm also, oh, sorry. I'm also chair of the community consultative committee that um, reports, provides advice to the board. And they're very strong that even though the board's got great adaptation actions, they still want the board to speak up about mitigation because they believe that um, all these voluntary groups are working really, really hard, but they really need, we need to address the problem of emissions. Um, level so the community is still very much on board with um, wanting to you know force as many politicians as possible to think very strongly about mitigation thanks shall I I'll just add a little tiny bit more on um, uh, community engagement with the health in in the health sphere um, I think we don't do it well I think every you know we're trying to do it better, or, or the health sector is trying to do it better. It's just such a broad question. <laughs> and there's so many ways you could you can think about it. But for example, within any grant application that you now put in um, through the university sector, they've all got a, a requirement for community participation in the in the, um, the planning. Um, what we found when we were, you know, talking to people to develop the case studies for that RACP report was that people in the communities that were really affected were just sick of people telling them or, you know, no planning whatsoever or no engagement. And then they were sick of being having experts sent out to, you know, they wanted to do it themselves. And we, you know, I think there's a growing recognition that um, communities need to be engaged at that local level, at all levels. Um, the, the Climate and Health Alliance is actually a, a sort of health community-based organisation. It's not government funded in any way. Uh, so that's how the health community is getting active and engaged. So that's sort of different perspectives on that concept. Um, I'm going to come at it from a slightly different perspective and maybe ask the question back. How should we be engaging more with communities? So, yes, so please, please come and give advice. Um, and I would love to hear perspectives on how to do this better. Um, I had a conversation earlier with someone about reaching out to schools and providing resources for schools to teach climate change at you know, primary, secondary level so that we start teaching them young. Um, I've done um, outreach for you know, daycare, primary and secondary schools. Um, unfortunately, COVID took a bit of a, a hit at doing the outreach stuff, um, but I would certainly love to engage more with communities and um, it was great to hear Scott talking about Indigenous communities because I feel like their voice has not been here today um, and I hope that we can do more on that front as well to hear their perspectives on the longer term climate change because they certainly have a longer knowledge than, than we do. Thank you. Uh, the role of fire and emergency services isn't directly um, talking about climate change, but educating community groups. Um, and remember that the bulk of the workforce is actually volunteers from community. So there's like 28,000 rural volunteers, probably about 10,000 or more SES volunteers. And a lot of that is through helping people through uh, field days, um, you know, events in the local council park or whatever, and meet your emergency services days, helping educate people what to do in case of fire or what to do in case of flood, cyclone, and those sort of things. So um, it's the effects of climate change that we're talking to people about mitigation and in uh, some ways adaptation, but not directly uh, I'm flogging climate change as a member of 
emergency leaders for climate action, but as a government agency, um, agencies or connected, they wouldn't specifically have a stand about climate change, but what are the effects on our communities through natural disasters and make helping people uh, better able to better respond and understand from that point of view. Yeah, well, one of the reasons as a retired person that we set up emergency leaders for climate action, particularly in that period of time, if you're a public servant, you know what you can say and can't say. It doesn't matter what UN uh, thing the government signed to, to, and some of that factors change. But the point I was making is that fire and emergency services uh, at the end of the spectrum, as we're all different, um, helping people deal with the effects of what's happening to them in a natural disaster. Perfect. Thank you, panellists. Do we have a, another question from the floor? Likewise, for those online, please feel free to pipe up if you have any questions as well. The first question I ask, are, are you able to have a few politically incorrect questions? I'm, I'm probably in the climate skeptic camp. So that's the angle of my questions. The this first is a, thing I think please. the problem we have is when we talk climate change, are we talking anthropogenic or non-anthropogenic? And I think you're framing the question the wrong way because the problem of the community now is climate change is solely anthropogenic and you've lost a large percentage of population. I'm amazed in my contemporaries in Brisbane, I'm nearly required here that the end, antagonism to the climate change question is polarizing the subject. In some way, you've got to reframe the question so it includes everyone rather than excludes. A good example is the conversation, the university outlet, it just uh, it eliminates any climate denial or skeptic questions. And I think they have some very valid arguments. So I think, and yeah, this is probably a broader question here, but probably the broader question here now is, a lovely day. Thank you very much. This is the start of the conversation, not the end. It should be kept going. But what we lack in our community now are generalists. And I think we've lost, somehow we've screened out the generalists and the other people we need to pull it all together. And I see a lot of, you know, listening here today, I see a lot of holes in the question and these questions and the topics raised. We haven't looked, and especially, is this unprecedented? Possibly, yes. But if you look, go back through history, there's a lot of things said. As one person said to me a year ago, a weather forecaster, we're actually living in a very benign period. And reluctantly, I have to agree with him. Yeah, we've had a very nice, pleasant sort of time. Is it about to change? I think it is. So adaption is probably more important than mitigation. I, I could go on. I realise it's politically incorrect and probably a bit antagonistic, but you know, I think you're losing a lot of the silent majority in, in, in this current sort of conversations. Question. Probably what I'd phrase then to our panel is, are there ways in which we can continue this discussion and promoting the challenges that we face when there is at times division within our society? Uh, thanks uh, for the question. I, I guess um, the most important thing is that we're all entitled to our opinions and we live in here today and now. And that's why uh, I, I pointed out during my presentation that one of the means that I chose to um, talk about to certain groups of people that were sceptics or are sceptics, it's about pollution in my mind. And it's the reduction of pollution, which is a key factor. Uh, and some of my colleagues at, at the Climate Council might say, well, you're a bit of a coward if you don't talk about climate change, but you've got to find different ways to communicate a message through to people. And uh, I think it might be related to Scott's last slide. If we act on pollution broadly and talk about that, well, it doesn't matter if the world doesn't blow up. It's a good thing, obviously, but we're doing good work and that's what needs to continue. And that's the kind of conversation 
Secondly, I think there's far more people in Australia that actually are right behind it uh, than we might imagine. And a number of agencies, a number of groups of people were not going to put their head up above the parapet a couple of years ago, and they're starting to appear. Another comment is um, I felt that the previous government almost made themselves irrelevant in the whole argument when business, agriculture, citizens, farmers, teachers were leaping ahead, local and state governments were providing leadership. And what was missing for us as Australians? A national policy on energy, a national climate policy that was cohesive and well thought, thought through. So um, what we, I agree, what we must not do is just completely ignore people with a different idea or a different set of opinions because sometimes we're both fixed and we're not going to move. But that's the way I approached it. I used the pollution angle, which seemed to be accepted by a lot of people. And uh, that was just my way of dealing with it because I don't necessarily like confrontation or arguing uh, with people because that doesn't help anybody, but that's the way I dealt with it. That was a very great response, Lee. Nice. Fantastic. Um, yes. Um, I also, as well as sort of trying to find people's values and what they care about, um, which was one of the approaches that um, Professor Catherine Hayhoe, if you've heard of her, she's uh, got a lot of talks online about the best thing to do about climate change is talk about climate change. Um, and, you know, coming and presenting at things like this is, is my way of sort of talking about climate change. Um, but also, you know, every year I've seen my climate change course grow at university. So I, it makes me happy that more and more people are interested in it from a wide range of different disciplines, from business economics through to um, urban planners and health uh, students. Um, but I think it's about everybody wants better health. Everybody wants to not have to um, cope with disasters like bushfires and stuff. So, you know, it's about improving and opportunities. I think if we also frame it around the potential opportunities, if we, if we make these changes, what are the other positives that we can gain from this improved biodiversity, improved um, healthcare, improved uh, water quality and air quality? All of these things are opportunities if we take the action um, that we need to for climate change. That'll be all these side side benefits as well, and nobody's going to say no to those. Um, people don't like. It's a psychological thing, you know, it's, it's challenging people's lifestyles. People don't want to change their lifestyles. And, and that's, there's, there's a lot of psychology around that and the Australian Psychology Association, I think it's called, has a whole report from a few years ago about the psychology of climate change. Um, and I find that a very useful report as a way of approaching um, and explaining to people who, who don't really want to, to listen or engage. So um, that's been a document I've lent on quite a bit. Thanks. I think it's a really, you know, it's a $64 million question. How do we cross those boundaries and reach across the aisles and talk to each other? And I think, you know, Catherine Hayhoe is absolutely right. And um, Helen was right too. I did get the right one. Oh, good. Suddenly, senior moments. Um, so it is about talking about it. You don't have to use the word climate change. We have to find the common ground. Um, we're all we're all human. We all have a lot of common goals and aspirations. Um, but the polarization and the politicization has been absolutely toxic. It's just been so bad for everything for our health, our economies, our politics, our community, our sense of identity. Um, so 
that is the, the sort of center of the problem that we, we still need to keep on working at. And, you know, it's wonderful that, that you are here today thinking that this is a wonderful um, venue, having a different perspective. So good on you. Oh. Yeah, um, I, I agree with everything that uh, has been said. Um, so it is about how do we have that conversation in, in a rational way and you know, there's always there, there's always going to be people who who need more evidence, uh, but I think you know when the evidence that you have, and particularly the evidence of the actions that need to be taken, are going to outweigh the the do nothing scenario. Um, that's what you should be talking about. I think we've seen enough today to see that there is genuine benefits in taking the actions that we need. And you referred to adaptation. Yes, a lot of those are adaptation um, type of activities. Uh, but you know, when you get down to the pollution question, it is about mitigation. So um, you know, do we want a better world for our kids? Um, yes, I think everybody would say yes to that. And I think we have the opportunity to move down that path. And we're seeing that the, the economics and the social benefits of action is what is going to lead us there. So um, completely respect, and there's always going to be different opinions, and that's that's great. Uh, what we need, and and this has been the unfortunate. I think um, uh, someone referred to the politicisation. Sorry, the politicisation of the debate. Uh, it's made it so we can't have these genuine conversations around a barbecue uh, without you know it becoming an antagonistic. Um, fight. My nephew works in the coal industry uh, and I love him, love him dearly, uh, but it's a conversation we can't have because of the way it, it, uh, the world has become. And that's not his fault, that's not my fault, that's just what's happened in this environment and we should never be like that. No family should have to do that uh, and no group of people should have to do that, not be able to have the conversation. So our question from the chat, is it possible to revegetate on an industrial scale? I throw that's, it down, down the end to start. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it, uh, it has been done, uh, and particularly in South East, South East Queensland, uh, so, sorry, South East Australia, down Victoria. Um, a, a mob called Green Greenfleet, who you know sell off offsets. Um, they've they've done revegetation on large scale. Uh, however, uh, when you want to revegetate um, to deliver genuine biodiversity outcomes, then it becomes much more difficult, uh, and it's more expensive. Uh, so then you know carbon farming is usually trying to get uh, like every business, you try and get the cheapest input to get the best, you know, to get the best profit. Uh, but if you're doing biodiversity farming, uh, biodiversity planning, then you need to have a mix of plants. Uh, you need to do it in a certain style and you need to maintain those for probably a little bit longer. So it, it's, a, it's a more expensive input, but it can be done. And we're just seeing that, you know, with technology, things are changing. People are talking about using drones, uh, for planting, you know, for planting seeds. Um, there's a number of new technologies that come up. But yes, I think as it becomes um, more profitable, then you'll see technology take off. But as well on the value of volunteers and their input, are there places that we need or roles when we need more volunteers to support us, whether that be across fire management, data collection, our health in industry? How do, can we go about engaging people to help themselves and their communities? Thanks. Um, if the problem, no, don't start off with the negative. <laughs> the, the, an issue is, is that Australia runs totally on volunteers now, and we have done for forever it's life-saving it's all of those things that we know right as i said earlier to the 
CWA ladies to the church group, to the Red Cross, to the fireys, to the SES, to whatever. And there's enormous strain, as I talked about, on those people in our communities, expecting a lot of them. But when you get knocked down, it was like the criticism of the SES in Lismore. How many SES volunteers do you think are in Lismore? Not a lot. And everybody expecting an SES boat to rescue them when the SES volunteers themselves are in the same predicament. So we're, we're overwhelmed in many cases by some of these emergencies and disasters, which are cre creating great stress, great mental health problems, great community problems. And as it keeps banging my head on about is it's affecting regional Australia, much more than city-based folk. And uh, the life and blood of Australia in the, in the country, particularly in food production areas, uh, we need people to stay there and have communities there. So the current government is talking and ELCA, the group I'm with, has written a letter to the um, Emergency Management Minister, have come up with an idea about a part-time potential for a part-time emergency response force um, for um, uh, the what we'd call the disaster season, which is predominantly uh, winter, uh, summer, sorry. Um, we're not entirely on board with that yet because the federal government has no jurisdiction in emergency response. And there's great, it's all state-based legislation, so there is no Commonwealth Fire Team or Commonwealth Ambulance Service or whatever. It's all state-based legislation. So we get down to the issues of federation and how it all works and all that sort of stuff. So that is being discussed and that may be a possibility because on the other side of the fence, everybody wants the military to come out and communities get a psychological lift when um, military units are in their place helping out and it's great, but that's not their main duty. So um, yes, we can continue to recruit, but like most of us in the room here, um, baby boomers, aging population, limited amount of young people, particularly in regional Australia, to get an able-bodied workforce to do what is quite challenging and dangerous work, particularly rural fire volunteers and people like that, it's it's a real challenge. So, um, yeah, it, it's we can't really give you the the golden answer to that one, but. I don't really have much to add in, except that we talk a lot about climate resilience and we need to, you know, sort of understand what that term means and work out how to build more climate resilient communities, but also, um, you know, teach people how to be climate resilient themselves. So, um, you know, Resilience is about, you know, using adaptation to be able to cope with these disasters or whatever it is. But um, I think, I think, um, uh, was it um, the flood? What was her name? Ella? Ella mentioned in her talk about 80% um, had insurance, but some people still thought they were too low risk to look for insurance on um, climate events um, and only 50% had a plan uh, or a kit or something like that. Can't remember the statistics, but, you know, in New Zealand, I worked in New Zealand for 12 and a half years. In New Zealand, we had regular tsunami day rehearsals. In fact, it's, I think it was last week, they had the regular tsunami walkout, you know, they have earthquake uh, drills at schools regularly. They have uh, earthquake kit uh, things that they send out. This should, what should be, you know, maybe we need to be, you know, maybe there already is that in Australia, but I've not heard about it. Maybe we should be getting everybody to be, or, you know, finding ways to make everybody aware. And I think part of it is knowing that you've got a uh, La Nina coming up. So this year you need to be aware of, flooding. Next year, when we know a few months in advance that there is an El Nino, we need to start thinking about 
bushfire awareness. And I know that's what the climate emergency leaders were trying to do. Greg Mullins was trying to prepare the government for the fact that the 2019-2020 season was likely to be a very, very large fire season. It was well predicted a year in advance, but they weren't listened to. But I think it's about, you know, knowing in advance and making sure that we put plenty of information about, about how to build res resilience for these potential upcoming events. Um, I know there's a lot of work going on in that space, but maybe, maybe we need a bit more. I don't really have much to add either. In healthcare, there is a big um, a big push and increasing recognition from even the very acute care focused specialists that primary prevention and primary health care local locally based, not in the big central um, uh, hospitals, tertiary hospitals, we need to be strengthening that base and Part of that is to be building the resilience of people and building the empowering people to take care of themselves more and encouraging us all as, uh, you know, to take responsibility more for our own health. Um, so I guess it, it sort of fits within what we're all saying. We all have to get a lot more um, literate, climate literate, really, and disaster literate, and we need to pay attention to the local government warnings and um, we're all we're always being told you know check your gutters make sure you're ready for this big rainstorm and we we've we've been probably fairly um, complacent in the past we haven't had to be quite so uh, vigilant and and um, take that responsibility but I guess we're coming to that time where we have to strengthen our communities as well get back to talking to our neighbours as well and making sure that we can look after ourselves and look after each other a bit more. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the dilemmas, um, you know, um, that uh, volunteering is really important because it is a way of bringing community together. Um, but, you know, if we rely on uh, volunteers to do the work that... Um, that, that should be paid work, then you know it, we end up with burnout. We end up with with people being um, unduly, I suppose, taken advantage of. But having said that, I think volunteerism also, also is a really can be a very powerful tool uh, for bringing communities together, uh, for empowering communities to take some control. Uh, and you know, we we talked before about you know what can you do in your own backyard because it is it is an issue that's bigger than all of us. Uh, but there are some opportunities where, you know, by volunteering to do um, some works, you're actually part of the solution. Um, there, there are examples. Um, I talked about uh, planting trees, but also, um, you know, one of the big, big gaps that we've talked about repeatedly today is, is data and monitoring data. And that's, you know, quite expensive. It takes a long time to collect enough data. Uh, we're in a space now where with, you know, everybody has... Uh, a smartphone in their pocket. Um, you can collect data with those smartphones that can be checked for, um, you know, its veracity. Um, so there, there, there are tools that we can use to, um, for volunteers to provide really good data sets that, that universities don't have the capacity to do, don't have the resources to do. So there, there are, there's a lot of opportunities arising. As I said, I think it's really important for communities. Uh, but I think it's it's really important, as Lee said, that, that we don't rely on that as our only response. Thanks, Scott. Um, just I've been allowed to make another comment, slightly off topic in, in a sense, but two points. One is until urban planning, town planners, developers are brought in line, all they're doing is building legacy buildings for the next 100 years or 50 years or 60 years, whether it be floodplain or fire zone, bushfire hazard zones or whatever, it's just one of my pet... It, because developers are only about getting a quid and they're off. Look at all those houses in the western suburbs of Sydney on the floodplains. Second thing I want to say is I want to tell you a story. At 
came to my mind just as listening there. Um, everybody's heard of if it's flooded, forget it, right? Why do we need to constantly advertise to tell people not to drive into water? Because messaging is hard. It's difficult. But the story of, of if it's flooded, uh, forget it, started for us in about 2005 in Queensland Fire and Rescue Service. We introduced a technical rescue discipline called Swift Water Rescue, right, which is where firefighters get into raging water and pull people out of their cars and what have you. It is the most hazardous practical skill. It beats firefighting, structural firefighting, anything that firefighters do is to get into the water. So I think through 2005, we rolled it out across the state and probably that into that Cyclone Larry year of 2006. In the first year of full operation in Queensland, we rescued 100 people using that technique. They cut it down and then they wouldn't be able to rescue. <laughs> well, the, <laughs> what, the quest, what it brought home to me is the movie Build the Field of Dreams, build it and they shall come because I said, well, what did we do in 2004? I don't remember rescuing all, all these people. But all of a sudden we got all these new customers and guess what? It's like using helicopters for bushfire fighting. We'll never be able to stop it. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. I think we've got time for potentially one more question before we wrap up our panel. Do we have anything final from the floor or online? We've got one up the, the back there. Um, I guess for me, uh, what gives you hope in the battle against climate change? Because when the 2019, 2020 bushfires happened, that really frightened me. And I, I guess I began to think the future is probably not pleasant. Um, yeah, like what, what gives each of you something to look forward to, I guess, in all of this? Yeah. <laughs> And we look forward to in our climate future. You have to be positive for, for this question. Um, that is a fantastic question. And it's when I teach about climate change, I always ask the students and talk to the students about solutions. We have to be creative. We have to, you know, look at the problem and come up with solutions. I will not accept an essay from them that is just about problems. I only want to hear what's the problem and how are you going to solve it? So I am actually heartened by hearing some of these talks today because I was probably the most doom and gloom out of everybody um, to hear about the great work that Queensland Health and the fire um, organizations and the floods and also the biodiversity projects are doing you know I think there has been a turning point um, and that people the awareness is is definitely there people know about it there's no excuses anymore um, I am heartened by the fact that the number of students in my courses on climate change is increasing so there's a, a desire to learn more um, but uh, you know they did some polls and surveys showing that I think it was like 70 to 80 percent of Australians wanted to see action on climate change you know we have to grab onto those people that are wanting to see action and say right let's let's move forward and I think with the voting in of a new government who not, doesn't necessarily have, uh, you know, climate plans that are going to reach our Paris Agreement targets, but has significantly stepped up Australia's um, pledges. We need to keep pushing them. We need to keep um, putting pressure on, but the fact that people voted for that change. And we see at Brisbane, three new green um, elected 
uh, representatives in our city, that gives me hope. And I tell my students, voting is one of the best things you can do for climate change. You know, you can do all these other actions. If everybody did a small amount of action, it would add up. Um, you don't have to be perfect, a small amount adds up. But voting is one of the biggest things we can do. So, you know, talking to people, I'll go back to that. Educating people, educating kids. Um, so they educate their parents and put pressure on their parents. Um, but just hearing about all these policies and changes, I think we're at a point where action is, is definitely starting to happen. Yeah. Can, yeah. Um, yeah, I think one of the key messages I got from that is the, the conversation has turned. So, you know, um, people, are, you know, when, when you talk about this, it's not as, um, I suppose, to do, taboo as probably what it was, you know, even five years ago. Uh, but the, we're starting to see uh, conversations that, that I wouldn't imagine that we'd be seeing. So straight after the 2019-2020 fires, um, like we've been talking um, to rainforest Aboriginal people about traditional fire management for, for a number of years. And there's a, a mob up there called Fire Sticks who've been doing some fantastic work. They work up in the Cape, but they also work all over um, Southern Australia as well. But they, they're a small organisation doing the best they can. Uh, but then straight after the fire, this, this, this term became popular. And it was in newspapers, you heard it on the radio, it was traditional fire management. So the Australia's conversation changed like that uh, from something that was no, on nobody's radar to all of a sudden being on, on everybody's radar. So, you know, and that's only one example. There's plenty of examples where the conversation has changed and people are much more um, open to the idea of, you know, making change, not only in their own personal life, but, you know, making change on, on a bigger scale. So that's, that's the number one thing I see. The other thing that I think is really important that's been touched on a bit is that there's more multidisciplinary uh, work happening now. So, so other disciplines are starting to reach out and working across trying to develop those solutions um, that Helen was talking about. So the example I've got is, is QF, QFES uh, contacted us uh, because they're looking at, you know, part of their remit or you know, um, emergency services is flooding. Um, so they're looking at an issue where Ingham is, you know, gets flooded quite regularly. Uh, and there's a number of solutions. Some of those solutions are infrastructure, but they've come to us saying, well, what sort of green solutions can we come up with? So, you know, starting to increase rehabilitation up on the, up in the uh, higher uh, reaches of the catchment to slow down the flood water. And so you'll still get flooding, but it'll become at a slower pace and won't be as high. So organisations like QFES are looking out and, say, and looking for green solutions as opposed to the traditional let's build a levee, which normally creates an issue somewhere else. If you build a levee and stop a flood water, you're just sending the flood to somebody else. So they're looking at what are the better innovative solutions that look at how nature has dealt with these issues. So we, we are seeing cross-disciplinary um, um, searches for solutions. So I think that's a real positive that is uh, to generate as well nowadays. Um, I think also we shouldn't forget our imagination and just imagine the fantastic world we would have if we had no fossil fuel burning uh, fueled cars, if we had light, you know, quiet streets with um, healthy air and green infrastructure and um, uh, biophilic solutions for everything so um there are there there are great possibilities that we should be thinking up about that are possible and that we can do and change is possible we've seen massive changes in the way things are done in the past um that was my first point there was another point which i've probably slipped out of my brain at the moment it has <laughs> Um, we're on the cusp of moving out of the old industrial age into whatever the new one is called. Um, I'm not sure if there's a name for it, if anybody knows it, but 
Um, part of that is that transition from fossil fuel based economy to a renewable energy based economy. It's happening whether you say yay or nay, because the most important factor is um, like your coal mining uh, relative. What I said about coal and coal miners is that when the investors pull the money from black coal, they won't give a rat's about the coal miners. And unless there was a policy to transition them to meaningful work, which I think the Queensland government announcement has done, um, it was gonna be a disaster. And everybody talking about shutting down coal. Coal won't be shut down, unfortunately for some, for a while yet, we're still going to need it. Um, but that transition from the old industrial age to whatever the new one is, is well underway. And what gave me hope was when I joined this group, ELCA, was how many groups of society had similar subgroups, like I talked about farmers for climate action, doc doctors for climate, there was a whole range of people, I was just blown away by the number of various interest groups that had signed up with the Climate Council to advocate for the future. So um, we must keep the dream alive. Perfect. Thank you again to our fantastic panel. And can we all thank them for their time today? Firstly, please, our panelists, you can sit down. So, so if we invited you here today on this question. Is Queensland prepared for a warming climate? And I think what we've heard is that possibly we are not prepared yet, but there are lots of good things on the way. So I don't know if you've, um, you, you, you've uh, uh, been here today and feel that that question has been adequately answered, but I think it has been well addressed so again, I would like to thank the panel um, again for addressing that question specifically that we put to them for you today. And I think they've given you some really good ideas, giving us all a good idea. So thank you again. And with that, we bring today's proceedings to a close. Thank you again for coming along and engaging in this session. As I said, it's been a long road here. And we are glad to finally have run our public forum. Now, if you do want to continue this conversation, there are plenty of ways to do that. Of course, the wonderful work being done here at the University of Queensland, there is plenty more to find out. Do keep an eye on the UQC's social media channels and articles that they do publish out very frequently across a number of topics. And secondly, of course, as the RGSQ, we continue to run a number of events and activities on a range of topics, many with a climate focus. And I would encourage you, if you're not already a member, to please consider signing up. Uh, we do have a few more activities for the rest of this year, and the program for next year is looking just as good. So please do consider that. Please keep this conversation going. And we look forward to see all of you at an activity very soon. On a housekeeping matter, we would, of course, love to see the space left relatively tidy. And for those with name tags, we would like to reuse them, of course, to make sure that we can run some other events off the same plastic. So with that, everyone, thank you so much. I will throw to Patrick for any final wrap up on his end and we'll see you all hopefully very soon. All right, thanks everyone. And I'd just like to thank uh, John and Rathney uh, for their fantastic contribution and the uh, um, RGSQ as well. Um, was, this was a really fantastic opportunity to sort of showcase a, a key debate. Um, I, I'm coming back to one of the questions that came through um, and sort of coming back to give us a bit of hope. My birthday's coming up in a couple of days. And um, I'm, I'm, my mother told me a story that when, probably about two weeks from when I was born, um, she was listening to uh, Radio National and Paul Ehrlich was on there and saying, we're doomed, uh, this is it. And she was feeling very guilty bringing me into the world. Now, I know there's a lot of issues out there, but it's 
50 odd years or so um, since uh, that happened. Um, and we're still here. We're still sort of working our way through the problems and through the issues. Um, I think we look globally, uh, there's been a reduction in poverty. All of the predictions of Paula haven't come through, not to say they haven't been delayed, but you know, it hasn't happened yet. And if you sort of remember in the 70s and 80s, sort of disaster movies there as well. We might be experiencing them now. Um, and, you know, I think probably last, you know, the, the 2020s, there seems to be key events sort of coming up all the time. But I think we've also shown incredible resilience in that factor. I think how we've responded to COVID, how we've responded to uh, the Black Summer, and how we're responding to the floods as well. So that's probably the, the hope that we have, that we are a very adaptable species. And this is very much coming back to some of my other research and we can tap into indigenous knowledge. And, you know, we, we've got, and Australia's really been, a, you know, a really good place for that. We've got 65,000 years plus of indigenous knowledge to draw on. And, you know, we've had stories about low sea levels, high sea levels, and so on. And um, indigenous cultures in Australia flourish in that area as well so there's a lot we can learn from that as well so i think you know compared to a lot of other parts of the world drawing on that experience and knowledge does make us still uh, a lucky country in that sense as well but i'd like to thank everyone for attending and yes and thank particularly the uh, organizers as well and anyone else who helped out so thanks Also, thanks online for people joining us. And I'll end it here. <laughs>